going to move, move uh, to our briefing agenda where I have asked for the chief of police and for the city manager to make themselves available um, to answer questions that members may have related. I'll tell you what the official meeting topic was. Uh, it says the response by the city of Dallas and partner government agencies to protests over the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020 in Minneapolis, as well as civil unrest leading to the declaration of a local state of disaster on May 31st, 2020. So um, my intention is I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask and I will try to be as, as quick as I can so we can get to members questions and um, you know, get through this as expeditiously as we possibly can. So I'll go right into it. If we have the police chief and the city manager available, let me confirm that first. Is, is everybody connected? Yes, sir, I'm here. This is Chief Hall. Wonderful, thank you Chief Hall for joining us today. And as our city manager on the line. Thank you, Mr. Broadnax for being here. So um, first question, and it's for uh, Chief, all of my questions I think are going to be um, for Chief Hall and that were related to um, the bridge incident, what we have, what happened on um, the bridge um, that we've heard a lot of public comment about. So the first question I have is, uh, were the protesters warned not to go onto the bridge, Chief Hall? Yes, yes, sir. That is what was communicated to me. Uh, I was not at the bridge, uh, but it was communicated prior to. Uh, there were multiple people out there. The incident commander uh, was out there, as well as the um, individual who, who was assigned to Dominique Alexander. Um, and there was a route that was determined. So and the, the answer is they were, uh, so I'm going to try to be as brief as I can yeah. with the question so that I can yeah. get, to, I know we have a lot of council members to get to. So the answer is yes, they were, is what you're yes. saying. So, so when on June 3rd, 2020, and an article in D Magazine by Tim Cato, he writes that Dallas Police Chief Renee Hall told reporters that protesters were warned marching onto the bridge would lead to arrest. I never heard that warning. I talked to more than a dozen protesters that night and the following day who never heard that warning. Journalists embedded within our march say they never heard that warning. You're saying that that's inaccurate and that you did issue a warning or that someone was, they, someone issued a warning. They were warned. It, it, You're saying that's an inaccurate not, statement. It, Yes, I did not issue a warning, but I was told that there was a warning that was issued. Right. So the statement, the statement in the in D magazine is inaccurate. I can't tell you what they heard, so I won't say what they heard was inaccurate. I can tell you what was communicated over the radio that they've been warned, and okay. and over the loud hailer that they had been warned. It was live feed from WFAA. Uh, Rebecca Lopez was out there stating that they had been warned. Um, and they went on the bridge anyway, and she was receiving gotcha. high. Okay. Um, good. Uh, next question. Was tear gas used against the protesters on the bridge? No, it was smoke. So no tear gas, but, the, but there was smoke. That smoke was, used. was yes, sir. So in, in this same article, uh, Tim Cato, um, he says, I do believe Hall lied at least once when she denied tear gas was used against us Monday night. Hall has confirmed tear gas was used against protesters in multiple instances prior to Monday. I asked the Dallas Police Department spokesperson on Wednesday whether tear gas was used on the bridge. He said smoke was used to disperse the crowd. It was not smoke. It was tear gas. I saw and smelled it. I heard anguish screams around me from those with burning eyes. We heard officers tell us that they would not use, quote, more gas if we complied with them. You're saying that it was not, in fact, tear gas. And again, this is inaccurate reporting, that it was not tear gas. It was smoke, is what you're saying. It was smoke, sir. That was what was, we were not far from the bridge. There was no smell of tear gas. If their, their tear gas would have been deployed, individuals would have not been able to talk, stand up. Uh, it, 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 was, it was smoke. Gotcha. Next question, were rubber bullets or what some people describe as less than lethal bullets used against protesters on the bridge? 
I don't know the answer to that. We are we are actively investigating whether or not uh, 40 millimeters were deployed at that time. So you, you don't know if there were any less than lethal bullets fired at anybody on the bridge? No, I don't because You're that there was no warning for that and I did I did not see that. I was not on the bridge, sir. So right. I'm so you, you don't. You, you, I just want to make sure I'm clear on something. So you, you're saying you still, to this day, have not confirmed, or you don't know whether or not rubber bullets were fired at protesters on the bridge. We know Is that, that what I, you're saying. We know that that was what the allegations were. Um, but the video that we sh that we show that I've seen so far, there's multiple videos. I, the videos that I've been shown at this particular point in time, I can't see the the 40 millimeters being destroyed at this time. Well, I'm still reviewing video every day, but what I've seen thus far, and I am not denying that they were used. I'm saying at this point in time, I'm not certain. I don't know. So you don't know. It's in the D Magazine article, the same one. I was lucky, the author writes, I avoided the gas. This is for someone who, who was there. I was lucky I avoided the gas that was largely blown off the bridge by a divine northern wind and wasn't struck by the, quote, less than lethal bullets indiscriminately blasted into the crowd. Those who were hit showed me massive blue and black splotches on their skin where they had been struck. I saw at least one bloodied face and heard stories about others. You're saying you have still no confirmation as to whether or not those people are telling a, a falsehood about whether or not they were hit with bullets, because they are certainly saying they were, and, and you're saying you have no knowledge of that. So I'm saying to you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not saying that they're not accurate. I'm saying I have no knowledge at this time. I have not that, been able that, to that's prove That's what I said, right? You don't have any knowledge of that. I, I haven't been able to prove that at this point, visually. And when in a, D magazine, in a Dallas Morning News article, written by Cassandra Jaramillo that was written on June 2nd, 2020, when she writes, smoke canisters which irritated people's eyes were released. He said people began to run. Pol police shot less lethal rounds of ammunition which hit Jordan in the leg. That, again, we, don't, we still don't know, despite these accounts, whether or not anyone was actually hit with any less than lethal rounds, whether those were actually, you still don't know whether or not any less than lethal rounds were deployed. I don't have any visual proof because I have not been able to see any video that confirms okay. that. I am not saying that they are not being honest. Right, but you don't know. You, don't, you still don't know. As of June 5th, we still don't know. You're, you're saying you still don't know as of June 5th. Moving on. Were there until, children- Until we can, re and, until I can review all video, Okay, understood. Moving on. Yes. Were there children on the bridge protesting? Yes, there were children on the bridge. How do, how do you know that? I saw an individual, one of the uh, activists came off of the bridge with her child and said, they let me go because I had my son. Who was in charge at the scene? The incident commander, Mike Igo. Mike Igo. Yes. Does he report to you? Major Mike Igo, he reports through the chain of command to Assistant Chief Avery Moore. Does everyone at the Dallas Police Department ultimately report to you? They ultimately report to me, yes, sir. Do you report to me? I report to the city manager. You report to the city manager. So you don't report to me, you report to DC Broadnax, the city manager. Yes, sir. Assistant city manager, John Fortune to TC Broadnax. But ultimately you report to the city manager of Dallas, not the mayor. Yes, sir. Did we have any conversation the night of the bridge? No, we did not, Incident? sir. Incident? Okay. We did not. And just the, my final question, just to be absolutely crystal clear, where would you say the buck stops at the Dallas Police Department? It stops with me and ultimately okay. my boss. Thank you. And ultimately your boss, which is who? TC Broadnax. 
DC Broadnax is your boss. And ultimately, it stops with him and with you. That's what you just said, right? Yes, sir. I think you said yes, sir. I couldn't quite hear you. Yes, sir. Okay, got it. All right, let's start with District 1. That's all my questions at this time. I reserve the right to uh, ask a few more if you don't mind. But District 1? District 2? District 3? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. All right. Um, first of all, thank you for calling this special call meeting. I want to thank all of the 200 plus um, residents and non residents of the city of Dallas who shared their uh, concerns. I like to start with this. There was a commercial they used to run on TV by Verizon. In the commercial, they said, can you hear me now? The reason I mention that is because if we listen to what was said, some of the things that were said by those who came down to speak are things that we've been hearing for years. It's time for an intervention. We're at a unique time. We are faced with the worst pandemic in the history of this country. We are also dealing with civil unrest unheard of since 1968. It's a moment in time like no other. We must meet this moment. When generations that will come after us, I want them to remember that I was on the right side of history. The right side of history requires courage. It requires leadership. It requires supporting a bold concept like reimagining policing and public safety. We have to look outside of the box and reallocate funding that would traditionally go to public safety and direct these dollars to address the poverty and hopelessness in black and brown communities. Funding that will provide services and communities of color by organizations of color. This is the type of intervention that saves lives and gives hope. If there would have been intervention on behalf of George Floyd, he will still be alive today. Let's not only honor the life of Mr. Floyd with our lives, let's honor him with our dollars and our policies that will prevent there being another George Floyd. Saying that, Mr. Mayor, I do have a question um, of Chief Hall. Uh, Chief Hall. Yes, sir. Um, give us some insight uh, into uh, the decisions um, last night in a memo sent by our city manager uh, in terms of those recommended policy changes. Does, do those line up with the 21st century uh, policing task force recommendations of uh, former President Barack Obama? Yes, sir, they do. If you look at the first sheet, um, it's the six pillars of the 21st century policing. It is what the department has done to date. Uh, under those six pillars. And then the future efforts uh, line up with uh, some of the things that uh, our uh, community stakeholders, advisory boards, and even some of the activists has asked for, such as an early warning system, uh, reporting of uh, traffic stops and, and data, uh, and, and use of force policy. These are things that uh, were ask of our advisory boards and working on through those things uh, and some of the activists who actually serve on the advisory board. So yes, they line up with both the 21st century policing as well as what some of our community stakeholders have asked for in the, in the police department. In light of that information, what has been the, the hold up? What has been the obstacle, the challenge that has stood in the way prior to yesterday of us being able, of you, being able to make those uh, those changes to the policy. So when we talk about uh, early warning systems and things like that, those are technology uh, requirements. And uh, one of the things that our technology was not, we did not have the in-house technology and the support system. So we use our IA Pro as a sub, sub bullet. And that was one of the things that had been on our uh, agenda with reforming our technology or bringing more technology with the early warning system. So some of it is a technology piece. Um, the uh, reporting traffic data um, and, and those things, 
uh, that's just about having a forward facing um, dashboard or a, a mechanism to get that information out to the community. And when we talk about cultural assessments and procedural justice, those are the things that we were working alongside of uh, uh, like Tony Brinker, who wanted the community one who was you know, working to get those things done in the department, but there were roadblocks um, at some at, at different points uh, to partner with those communities, not necessarily on the police department's uh, portion, but some roadblocks with the, the community and funding and, and things like that. So uh, these things were being worked on, um, but there were some things that kept us from moving forward fairly rapidly. What about the duty to intervene policy? What's been, what's been the... Uh the issue in the past of, of implementing that particular policy? So we've always, it's always been understood. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that, you know, what we need to make sure that we're listening to our community because it's understood when we come to the police department, when you get hired, um, you're asked that integrity question that when something happens, what is your responsibility? And everyone coming on the job answers that question the same way that they're going to let someone know if some kind of illegal activity is taking place. So in our culture, it was understood. Now we put it in writing to make sure that it's visual and everybody sees it in black and white. Okay. Um, that, that, I think that's one of the challenges, not, not, not speaking to, to you and, and, and DPD, but the culture, the culture of policing. And it should be understood as you know, as I'm sure many officers who were part of who are part of the Minneapolis Police Department would have said, you know, it's a given that if you see someone who's you know exerting excessive force um, on someone who doesn't have any kind of weapon, that you intervene. But that was not the case. If that was the case, George Floyd would may be, you know, in, 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 in hospital, he may be injured, but he wouldn't be deceased. And so I'm, I'm, my concern is the implementation, or, or let me put it this way, the consequences, a repercussion of failing to follow these policies. Um, former officer uh, Amber Geiger was asked, was she, did she receive training in this space in terms of de-escalation. I don't remember, you know? And so we can't have another Botham John. We can't have, Dallas cannot afford a George Floyd type of situation. We cannot afford any more incidents of this nature. And so that's why um, I'm focused on um, consequences, you know, violation of policy, you know, um, what would be the consequence of someone who violates the policy of a duty to intervene? What would be the consequences of an officer who violates warning before shooting? Because if they violate that one, we're going to have a situation where someone has been killed, probably an African-American male uh, who was unarmed, and the city, once again, will be in alarm. And next time, uh, I'll probably be leading the protest if that happens. So talk to me about that. Consequences for violation of these two policies in particular. So, so I, I, I agree with, with, with what you're saying, uh, Councilman, and you're absolutely right. And so what we uh, look at is the incident itself, what the outcome is, and those officers involved uh, are disciplined up to the point of being terminated. So, you know, if you have a duty to intervene and, and let's say it's not necessarily excessive force, but it's reporting some sort of uh, violation that, that uh, the individual was not supposed to do, well, that may receive a different level of discipline than someone who is using excessive force on a, hand, on a handcuffed individual or apply, applying pressure to a neck, that would warrant termination. So it, it's, it will be different circumstances for different incidents. All right. Se All right. Seven seconds, Mr. Thomas, for your first round. Thank you. In, the, in two of them, I'm going to say, Chief, tell us about 
the most recent incident in terms of the individual who was shot by the rubber bullet. That's so we had, we had two incidents of individuals who were struck by those projectiles. The one incident, the individual ended up with a broken jaw. Uh, I've reviewed the video in that case, and it was concluded that it was done by an outside agency wearing a uh, green tattoo. Uh, we have ruled out DPS. It is either between Garland or Irvin. And so right now we're trying to solidify which agency it was. All of those chiefs are looking at the video to confirm uh, which one of their officers deployed that level of force. And we recognize that we um, ask those individuals to come in to support us. Uh, so again, uh, we feel the, a level of culpability and that is never the result that we want when we deploy less than lethal force. Uh, and so uh, we recognize that, that that consequence is there and uh, we have our culpability for it, but it, is, it was not our intention. Our goal is to use um, that less than lethal, lethal force and that's a wooden, a, a wooden uh, that person used a wooden bullet. Uh, we use a, a plastic that is uh, wrapped in foam. And so, um, again, that's where we are with the investigation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will be back for a round two. Of course. We're going to go back up to District 1 because he was muted and we couldn't get him unmuted. Uh, Mr. West. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. That was actually my fault. User error. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a uh, just a, one question for Chief Hall that uh, we didn't get answered, you know, just previously. And you had made a statement in uh, your last press conference that you believe your first job is to protect and enforce the law. And, and I agree with that, that uh, it's very important uh, part of your job is to enforce the law. But do you not also believe your job is to protect and serve the community? Because I think serve is a big part of the job. And if the answer is yes, you do believe that, what, what do you see that falls within the service aspect um, of that um, task? Uh, the, uh, service a the service aspect falls in that I have a duty to the community to make sure that they are protected, that we hear them, that we respond to uh, the needs and make sure that they're safe as well. All right, thank you. And then I just have a comment, Mr. Mayor. Over the last few days, we've seen peaceful protests that ended in violence, destruction of property, and disturbing actions of some police officers that need to be investigated. We've also seen demonstrations, uh, demonstrators peacefully calling for change to Dallas neighborhoods. I personally walked with some of the protesters in my neighborhood in North Oak Cliff, where fo people expressed to me their frustration and their anger um, and, and gave me their opportunity to listen, which I really appreciate. Um, as I speak with city management and council members and advocates, I'm gonna continue to urge the city to examine our operations and procedures. I wanna emphasize that in some ways, the officers here were really just acting to the policies that were in place. We need to review those policies. And if they aren't working, we need to change them. I'm also calling for some very specific reforms that I would like for the city manager to look at now. Police training, train officers how to engage with and protect peaceful protesters, require de-escalation training to every officer early in their, in their training. Fix the imbalance of de-escalation training and firearms training. Officers should have as much training in how not to use their service weapons as in how to use them responsibly. I also wanna make sure we aren't relying on officers from our partner agencies, the state, DART, who don't meet the standards that we have for de-escalation tactics. For police identification, we should require that name badges and identification be visible on all DPD officers and also any of our partner agencies that are helping us out. We need to commit to publicly identifying partner agencies involved in responding to DP, uh, Dallas protests. So we need to understand you know, who those officers are and folks need to know who they're interacting with not, not everybody is DPD. We need to re require active body cams for all officers involved in protest patrol and make those videos publicly available. And we need to improve our standards of recruitment and review when hiring officers from other agencies. We don't want bad apples. We want the very best of the best and we need to improve our police recruitment and our salaries 
so we can draw the best of the best. And lastly, I have heard my constituents who have been um, talking today and who have also reached out to me and said, look at the budget, look at the priorities, and don't forget that we need to prioritize housing, we need to prioritize homelessness, and we need to prioritize programs in the areas um, where, where, where folks are hurting, where they need help. Um, our housing policy and our homelessness policy is very important to the city, and as chair of, those, of that committee, I'm committed to ensuring that our budget is viable to get the affordable housing we need to give people quality housing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Did District 2 get connected? District 4. District 5. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so just, just thinking just broadly here, I mean, um, about the whole what's happening in this country, um, to me that just there are no words that, that feel right in, in the face of injustice. Uh, but I know that silence isn't the answer. So I do want to begin by saying that black lives matter. And we all know that the criminal justice system, or as some like to call it, the criminal injustice system, falls too heavily on people of color, particularly members of the, of the black community. So I think it's important for all of us and it's essential for all of us to, to continue this fight, uh, not only for, the, for George Floyd's justice, but for all the other names before and after his. Um, and so, as a Latino, I know it's difficult and it's impossible for me to fully understand and comprehend uh, the injustices that black men and women and children have faced um, since this country's inception. I am aware that um, as an attorney, as, as, as an elected official, I got to where I am today because the black community took a stand during the civil rights movement and I'm here to take a stand um, at this time. And um, so, Chief Hall, I, I don't have any questions in terms of what happened um, any of any day this past weekend um, and, th and this whole week, because there are obviously varying perspectives um, of, of what occurred. So I don't think I will gain anything from telling you, asking you about your perspective. But I am curious to know what type of de-escalation training do officers receive? Every officer, uh, when they come onto the job, they have a, a de-escalation. We are even when we go back through four, uh, time, distance, and cover is what we continue to uh, press upon. Uh, time being, uh, there's no need to rush in uh, to make sure that you dis and, and distance, to distance yourself from the threat if you can in order to gain uh, as much information before you react and cover, to take cover, use uh, the vehicle, trees, and things like that to cover yourself um, to keep your shield yourself from any threat that may may happen. So that, and then you also want to make sure that we're not we protect the the individual because we don't want to to move in too fast or and and deadly force is our last resort, which is the reason we have multiple less than lethal weapons. We have a ta we have spray, we have a taser, um, the forty millimeter and pepper balls and then also gas. And so, you know, the, the, the goal is to have more or less than lethal so that the absolute last result is your firearm. And how often do officers receive this training? Uh, once core, they use uh, one, uh, 40 hours of training, but they go through that every other year. So every, every, every other year you get uh, 40 hours of training, but it's not all in, in de-escalation. I think there's an eight hour block of de-escalation, a four hour block. Four or eight hour block of de-escalation once every two years. Yes, sir. Do you believe that the, tra do you believe that the training is effective? I, I believe that the training is effective for the most part. I, I believe that, um, you know, in varied situations, uh, individuals uh, may, may deviate from it or the situation re uh, requires them to deviate from it or they make mistakes. I think that's a, um, a, a, a piece that we forget is that we're making split second decisions that other people have days, hours, and weeks to go back and look at. And these officers every day have to make these decisions as they're happening and they happen in seconds. And so um, is there more training needed? Yes, we welcome it. 
um, and we will train uh, as much as we can, uh, you know, to make sure that it's like muscle memory, that everything we do is, is like muscle memory and, and it's automatic and that's our goal. So, yeah, but our, I do wanna say that our deadly, uh, deadly force statistics are down uh, in comparison to previous years. Okay, uh, and I, I totally understand the difficulty of, of doing the job of a police officer. As you are aware, I am a war veteran, so I can relate uh, in, in a very personal way um, with the job that DPD has to do every single day. Um, would, you, would you have done so anything differently um, over these past few days? So the, the decisions that I made at the time, uh, I believe were the right decisions. I think what's important to know as we, we talk about uh, each incident was different each night. And you and I talked about, you just said the, the perspective. Uh, when we started Peaceful on Friday, we ended up with uh, riot. And I know that there's conversation about there being a handful of people, but there's video that shows that there's hundreds of people looting and setting vehicle, uh, police vehicles on fire and throwing bricks through police officers' windows and flattening tires. And then on Saturday, uh, a similar act of multiple individuals using firearms, shooting through uh, windows, breaking in, looting, uh, and assaulting police officers. On Sunday, uh, there was a meeting, I'm sorry, on Monday, there was a meeting uh, with one of the organizers, uh, Dominique Alexander, who uh, basically stated uh, in a threatening manner that he was going to hit the city in the pocket. He was going to hit us where it hurts in that 1% so we could feel uh, what it was that, that, that they were feeling uh, and that um, you know, he didn't care about going to jail. He had money as long as his you know, leg or all in his pocket. And so um, you know, making sure that no other violence, no other um, activity uh, took place, no breaking of, of, of windows and, and looting happened as we saw that the um, individuals were attempting to take the bridge. Uh, it, there were multiple attempts according to the incident commander to stop them, even once they got on the bridge, asking them to leave the bridge. The prevention was to prevent them from going into Trinity Groves and doing what they had done. Uh, in the downtown, uptown, Victory Park, uh, and other parts of the city the previous week. Now, <clears throat> now, do we know that that was going to happen? No, we don't, but each of those protests started peacefully and ended very differently. Yeah, and, and I, I totally understand with the DPD's use of reasonable force if they're, you know, um, feel like they are in, in, in any type of physical danger. But overall, I mean, we, we've heard from the community and generally DPD couldn't have handled most of what happened any more poorly and from my perspective as well. And, and I don't think that the law and order rhetoric that we've been hearing uh, from the department is the way to go at this time. Um, I, I think we need to exercise patience. I think we need to exercise understanding because moving forward long-term eroding public trust is going to put all of us in, in even more danger and, and put us in a position where we're still dealing with um, protests and potential uh, looting and destruction of property. So I, I think we need to be very careful about um, the way that, that we've been handling, the DPD has been handling this situation. Um, and, and, and just generally here sitting with my, um, on this body with my colleagues as policymakers, we can't continue to do what we've done in the past, which is nothing. History has shown that our government has given people of color and, and people from marginalized communities scraps when it comes to equity policy. And so as the vice chair of the, of the Workforce Education and Equity Committee, I, I, I pledge to listen, I pledge to act because it's way past time. And, and, and I think that divesting resources from the police department is, is the only way to go at this time. We need to be investing in, in, in providing access to higher social, economic, and political power. Because from, from my perspective, systemic change can only be brought about by combating systemic racism. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor, at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So District Council, Member, Council Member Sendez. 
can, can I just he, say he that? He said he was, okay, go ahead. And, he, and then uh, District 6, go ahead, very uh, briefly, Council, please. Councilmember Sanders, I just want you, you to know that uh, uh, we will, we learn from every incident. Uh, we, we see where we could do things differently and that is what we assess every day. Uh, and can we, can we do things differently? Absolutely. Uh, and that's our goal is to be better in the future every single time. Thank you. District six. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so chief, I have one of my questions is the curfew started on Sunday, correct? Yes, sir. And what time did the curfew begin? At 7 p.m. So I have a question about streets being blocked at 5.30 p.m. across downtown and the other areas in, in the city. I have pictures of uh, cars that had streets like Canton and uh, all, just all around downtown where we were already blocking streets at 5.30 p.m. Why, why would we be blocking streets and closing downtown at 5.30 if the curfew begins at 7 p.m.? So that was, um, we were, when we saw individuals walking, they were walking in large groups. And so we were attempting to shut off the traffic so that the, we didn't, there was no information given to us for that particular protest. So we didn't know exactly which way they were gonna come from. And when we saw them, they were coming in packs. So the, uh, our goal was to try and prevent traffic from hitting them because they were traveling in packs to uh, headquarters. We, once we realized that, they, um, that we were impeding uh, their ability, we instantly moved uh, to make room for them, but we were just acting uh, from a cautionary perspective because we had no information. And then we saw large groups walk, they were walking um, towards headquarters and some were on the sidewalk and some were in the street. How many tickets for curfew and how many tickets and or arrests for violation of curfew were issued on Sunday? And at what time were those tickets and arrests started on Sunday? Uh, I think it was 124, uh, approximately 124. And it started at maybe about 7.30, 8 o'clock because the protesters were in front of um, headquarters at 7 and we had talked to them and talked to them and, and asked them to leave. And then I went over and had a conversation with them and it was about 7.30 when they actually uh, voluntarily dispersed uh, out of that area. So it was after 7.30. So the reports that I'm getting from folks that said that they were in downtown or on the edges of downtown or the, the, the curfew zones and they were getting uh, arrested and or ticketed at seven, between seven and 7.30, is that valid or invalid? I, 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 can't, I, I can't say that, it, that they're invalid. I know that the curfew started at 7 a.m., I mean, 7 p.m. And in the area where we were, where the curfew uh, was assigned to, at, there, were, there was no movement in that area until after 7.30, after the protesters dispersed in the area of, of, of uh, Jack Evans. So the 124 tickets, were they all, of those 124 tickets, those were strictly for curfew violations? I, I would have to check, I have to get that information. That's how many uh, arrests that we made, but I need to make sure exactly how many were specifically for. Uh, and and why, did, why did we have to take people to jail if they violated curfew? Why couldn't we write them a ticket and send them on their way? The goal was to get them off of the street to deter looting and rioting. So we couldn't have um, given them a citation and escorted them outside of the zone and kept them out of the zone instead that, of taking them to jail? That, will, that requires much more resources for us to um, give special attention to each individual that's violating the curfew. But we had enough resources, but we had enough resources to take 124 people to jail. Yes, Doesn't that take resources? Locations. Yes, sir. But they, but what we did with that was we used vans for transportation. So there wasn't individual officers. We used DART, am I correct? 
I'm sorry. You use dark buses, am I correct? Yeah, dark vans, yes, sir. Well, that's a shame. Um, what, what, what I really like to see happen with those tickets of folks that violated the curfew, as long as they didn't have any other illegal act going on, I think that we need to do the same thing we did for the protesters on the bridge. And we need to drop those curfew charges on them. And we need to get that done um, expeditiously, immediately if possible. My um, next question is about the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge. Um, was, was there a barricade on the ramp that, they, that the protesters used to get onto the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge? No, sir, there was no barricade. So there was no barricade on the ramp? I'm sorry. Going up? Going up or, or on the other side? Going up. The, they, my, they had to get onto the bridge. So I know this is my district. So I know they, that Riverfront has an on-ramp and an exit ramp and you can get onto the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge. And the way they were walking would appear to me that they went up a ramp, up the up ramp to get onto the bridge from Riverfront. So was there a block blockade there or not? There was a, a vehicle there. There were police vehicles there, but there was no blockade, no uh, traffic cones or anything like that, but there were vehicles at that location. So there were vehicles that would stop any traffic coming from Riverfront turning onto the, the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge to go westbound to get onto Singleton? Vehicular traffic, yes, stop vehicular traffic. Was the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge itself closed, coming westbound off of Woodall Rogers, going towards um, West Dallas when the bridge eventually becomes Singleton? No, it was not. So the bridge was not closed? It was not closed. Okay. So, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't expect them to go to the bridge. So, so that, 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 that's, a, that's a really interesting question for me then is, so there were news reports that a route was shared by Dominique Alexander with some law enforcement. I don't know who, but who gave, who, who was there a route given? And, and if not, when was the last time or at what point were you in communication with Dominique Alexander on Monday? So uh, he was communicating with uh, one of the sergeants that we had, and he was the route was to go around the, Pro the Crowley building, go around in a circle. The communication <clears throat> that I had uh, at, was at the time when the arrest took place, and uh, he called myself, council members, uh, chief of staff, asking why we were making those arrests. Okay, so there was there was a route shared. He he shared a route with the sergeant that was assigned that that's usually assigned to him to make sure that we have the information to be able to block the streets uh, and protect them. And he shared the route that he was going in a circle around the Crawley building. And so he that he's not being truthful. Right. So he he gave DPD a route that said he was going to stay on Riverfront. Yes, and go in, go in a circle around Riverfront. Was that a yes? I, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, my next question is, do you condone the militarization of DPD? I don't d condone militarization of any police department. Uh, and I don't believe that the Dallas Police Department is militarized. Uh, so so who, who invited the National Guard to assist DPD and the state troopers to assist DPD? So, so we invited the state troopers to assist. The governor actually activated the National Guard for all the state of Texas. He deployed them to their bases and the state police used them uh, as they saw fit. And so, so who, who was in command of the National Guard while they were here in Dallas? The state police. The state police. Okay, very good. Um, That's your time uh, for this round, Mr. Narvaez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a few more questions for the next round. Thank you, Chief. Sure. Mr. Babazua, District 7. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I <clears throat> About the other agencies that come in, uh, Chief, are, are the other agencies eligible to, to have um, interactions with our public taken up by our Citizens Police Oversight Board? 
I'm sorry, ask that question again. Are the outside agencies that we have for mutual aid, such as the troopers or um, in this case, the National Guard, are they eligible for us to um, start an investigation and it be taken up by the Citizens Police Oversight Board? No, sir. Okay, and with knowing that um, and knowing that we are um, are going to have peaceful protests that are um, addressing an overall bigger problem of of um, excessive force. Is it is it the best strategy, even if they are being here, uh, to have them as our front lines and those who are responding with um, much more of a military style strategy? So I, I guess I'm trying to understand your question. Are you I'm saying if we if we know that we cannot put them in front of the citizen police oversight board, is it um, is it I, I, I is it the, the most logical use of putting them as those who are firing the bullets, as those because you you've, you've already answered that the that we we have found out that they were wearing green fatigues, which means they were probably the uh, national guard, which means there will be. Yet again, no discipline taken on another uh, law enforcement um, officer who used excessive force. And so we have to um, evaluate, why do we have a Citizens Police Oversight Board when, when we know we have something with very high stress um, and high tension uh, going on in the city, why are we going to put the, the faith in, into the outside agencies to be on the front lines? So I, I just want to remind you that the night prior, the city was being set on fire. Buildings were being set on, I mean- uh, Well, I understand that and I was actually gonna get to that. I, I mean, if, if I will actually segue into that. You, you, you said that, that the reason that the stop happened on the bridge specifically was because there was concern that they were headed to Trinity Groves. And to me, that is a direct statement that in a police mindset, chooses property over life. We have peaceful protesters and we have four different law enforcement agencies present. And I'm supposed to believe that we don't have the capability of forcing that crowd down Beckley whenever they get across the bridge. I think that I, I, I just, the reason I'm asking this is that I, I know that you've had answers for everything that we've asked, but I haven't heard you tell me what was done wrong. So, Councilman, when we look back at the situation, uh, is there room for an assessment and saying we could have done things differently? I would, I would admit to that. Again, we will do a thorough assessment and after action report on everything that we did and look to see where we could have done things better. Um, it, was there an opportunity not to use the less than lethal? Was there an opportunity not to use gas? What is the, our, our thing at that point in time, what is the alternative for a, a rowdy, riotous crowd? What would you consider um, uh, a reason to need to fire either a gas canister or a non-lethal round? Uh, when the bricks, bottles, Molotov cocktail are being thrown. So, so knowing that none of those things happened on the bridge, we can go back to my last question and, and finding out what can you say has been done wrong. Uh, uh, right off the top, we know that force was used that wasn't warranted if you just said that it would need to have those actions taken to warrant those uh, responses, correct? I'm sorry, just talking with the mute on. So, so some, some level of resistance needed to be uh, present and in hindsight, maybe that was not uh, the right action at, at that time. But, the, but the point again, that I'm getting I, at is that again, I'm not, I'm not, no. I'm not. But again, 
I don't know the actions because I have not seen video relative to them using the less than lethal at this time. And I'm still waiting to be, to review that video. I have not received any video with that at this time. I, I, I just am trying to make a point that I, I understand that there will be a lot of change and a lot of things that needs to be worked through. But I don't think that we're going to get there unless we can have um, not just the chief, but police as a whole who are willing to know what was wrong. And if, if we're gonna have conversations and continue to, um, to, to, I guess, justify, instead of realizing where these things could be different, I think that it is, it, I, I, that's, that's where I'm having a hard time. You know, I look back, I was, I was actually on the streets in, in downtown on 7-7. And I have asked myself over and over and over since last Saturday, how we had not only the deadliest, but the most horrific and tragic night of our law enforcement history in this city and did not require the use of any gas weapon or any non-lethal rounds. And the de-escalation happened not even knowing where the bullets were coming from and they were being targeted at officers. Why were we able to de-escalate that situation in a protest-type atmosphere, and yet we had to result to the, the means that we've done this past weekend? What I were think, different? I think the, the, the thing that we can't do is compare 7-7 to what was happening. No, no, I'm not comparison, comparing what happened. I'm just saying there were bullets flying. I, 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 was, I remember everyone was... Freaking out, they didn't know where the bullets were coming from. They knew that they were being aimed at the police. And one, one thing I can, can I, can I just explain? Gas is less than lethal. At the time, deadly force was being used against the officer. So there were multiple circumstances around it becoming a massacre and, and, and tear gas. There was use the lethal force was the what was required at that time, not less than lethal force. There were bullets coming at the officers. So the, the response was to fire bullets or take cover in order to ensure that we're protecting the, the crowd, those innocent people who were in the crowd, as well as police officers. So those are two totally different situations. Less than lethal is used, councilman, so that we can disseminate a crowd distract them so that we can move in to make arrests so there's the least amount of force in that process rather than going comp going hand-to-hand -hand combat, which ultimately ends up in some larger level of force. And that's why it was used. Um, okay, I want to second what Councilman Narvaez said with the curfew um, arrests on Sunday. I, I, I can say that there was a, a video at 7.14 p.m. of somebody that I know personally who was shot on live video twice by uh, rubber time, bullets by the way. and then arrested at 7.14 p.m. We'll, we'll get you that information. District 8. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Chief Hall and uh, also T.C. Brocknett. Um, um, I've been around a long time, you know, all raised in the city of Dallas. On, I'll be 64 years of age on my birthday in July. You know, I was sitting here listening to the conversation and also listen to the people. And, and that's what we've been doing. We've been listening to everyone. I am not the chief of police. I'm not the city manager, but the city manager do report to me. And as the chief, you have obligation, you had duties, you got to make sure the city is safe, and you do have people who report to you who got to be accountable also. So this aftermath, and, and I had to be very, very careful to say George Perry Floyd. If George Perry Floyd incident would not happen, we would not be here today talking about what's going on in the city of Dallas with protests. We would not be talking about government policy or what happened, or what could have happened, and what did happen. The people in Dallas is frustrated. Uh, I am frustrated also. And the reason why I'm frustrated is because I live here. 
And I'm frustrated because my hand is tied behind my back. And whatever we do, it got to take the council members, the community, and everyone working together for the same accord. And this seven day a nightmare that have focused the spotlight on the city of Dallas, the great city of Dallas that we live in. And everyone looking at us to say, what mistake did we make? Can we correct those mistake and how we move forward? I learned a long time ago, playing football or in the project or whatever, once you make a mistake, you learn from that mistake. If you think you did make a mistake, still try to learn from that mistake. And what I want to do is that listen to you and listen to all the speakers who spoke today. And I applaud them to come down here and I applaud the mayor and I applaud everyone to take the opportunity to listen to each and every one of them. They all had a different story. It was like the tale of two cities. You know, I'm black. We can say a color, but I'm a black man that we've been facing this all my life. This ain't the first incident about racism, racism, a bias, a government policy, a criminal justice. So, uh, TC Brockless, are you on the line, TC? Is TC there? Yes, sir. What I want is when all those speakers came here, those 200 speakers who came, and whatever the, the, the council is asking those questions, I would love I would love to have a briefing. I want every question that people ask and every question addressed and answered. And we look at that because right now it's going to be hard to collect all these thoughts. Who is right? Who is wrong? Who made the decision? How do we correct that, that decision? I don't know what correct. You know, we got video. You know, did, did you do this? Can you change this? Can you do this? But it's, this is not an inquiry. This is something that we need to learn. If it happened again, and God forbid that it never would happen again in the city of Dallas, nowhere in the world. But it did happen. But TC, how, how long would it take you after this briefing, or whatever you want to call it, to compile all of these questions and give us report and address these issues that our council members is having, the mayor is having, the community and everyone has. Because I think they need to be addressed. I think the public want to hear the answers. Well, Councilman, thank you uh, for that. And, you know, quite a few speakers uh, talk through a lot of things, whether personal or just larger perspectives on uh, what they believe uh, these current moments mean to them and what they've seen, whether on TV or experience themselves uh, on the bridge and or at many of the other peaceful protests. And so obviously, in addition to the council listening, our staff and the chief's team have been listening. Might be difficult to distill, uh, particularly all questions that might have just been directly related to them. But I think as the chief had indicated, uh, what she's going to do is do a review and assessment of uh, the week and obviously a day-by-day -day type of an understanding of incidents that might have occurred, uh, things that may not have been done the right way, uh, and then figure out what, if any, discipline may be necessary, should it have been any violations of the code, especially then the is issue with the bridge incident. I do expect the chief and her team uh, to do a full uh, internal review of that uh, to see what happened that night uh, and what types of decisions were made. Uh, and again, as the chief said, to see what adjustments and or things they can learn from that. And if anything, again, was not done appropriately, uh, the chief, uh, like she has always done, would take the necessary discipline. Uh, and so I think I can't tell you how long that will take, because uh, again, the events of these last few days, uh, there's probably been a lot of things that they need to review but I will ask the chief uh, to give me what she believes, uh, working with her team, uh, the timeline uh, for doing that. But again, I think we'll all go back and listen to the tape. Uh, but the common themes were just people, in my opinion, feeling like uh, what happened on the bridge uh, was inappropriate, 
uh, and uh, in some cases had some concerns about how we provided what our duty was, and that's to protect and serve. And so, again, I think we'll review that. I can't give you a date tonight, Councilman, but I will work with the chief uh, to outline how she's going to go through her review with her team. Well, and thank you there also, um, PC, but also I would just ask you to do this. You know, once you do get with the chief and once you do review the video and, and review all our comment, you know, I think the citizen, I think the council member, we all need to be on the same page. I think that we should not go out there and say, hey, chief, uh, you second guess yourself, or hey, city manager, do you do this? But the question need to be addressed. I think we owe the citizen of Dallas what happened. Are we gonna correct the problem? Are we gonna need to change policy? The policy need to be changed. Whatever need to be changed, or how we move forward, but we just can't just beat on something that happened yesterday. We should learn from yesterday and move forward. To be a great city, that's to be a time, great leader, we got to move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be around time. Time too. Thank you, Mayor. Of course, of course. Uh, District 9. My light went out. So, um, uh, so I do have a couple of questions. And um, I mean, my question was going to be, how would you rate DPD handled the protests of the last week? And I do believe that you're going to be doing an assessment of that, and we would be getting that briefing uh, later. Um, my next question is relating to the curfew. What are the plans going forward with that? Are we going to keep it in place? Are we going to modify it? Or uh, what, what does anybody have any idea? So, um, so council, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Uh, it, it's going to be my intention, uh, I think, to talk with the chief, uh, and she can consult with her team about whether or not uh, the curfew uh, should go through its seven days that had previously been authorized, uh, and or if they believe that uh, we should uh, stop it earlier. Uh, and so. She'll obviously give me that recommendation uh, based on what they've been seeing or expect to see over the next few days. Uh, but uh, I'll defer to the chief. I think she has expressed uh, her thinking on that already and I'll, she can share that tonight if she wants with the city council. Um, and um, I mean, uh, I've had a couple of, of people reach out to me and wanting it lifted. Uh, it's a double whammy, given that we were coming out of COVID, we were starting to open up and then we shut back down in some places. So I've had some individuals that have reached out and said we would love for, um, we would love to lift the curfew or modify it if it, if it can be. So I, I would um, ask you to seriously consider that. Um, I do have a question on riot gear. I'm, um, the, the interesting thing is when you see um, uh, it's all about expectations, and when you see somebody coming out in a full gear of some sort, then the expectations on both ends rise to that it's going to be at that spot, that it's going to get to that point. So my question, what is our policy or our practice on when is it in, when does riot gear actually, um, when, when does our police department or police officers, when does the riot gear become part of the, of, the, of, the, of the uniform? So thank you for that question, Councilwoman. Um, and our policy or our practice is we don't show up in riot gear. Uh, and if you look at Friday and Saturday, even after Friday evening, uh, with all the, of the, the things that were transpiring, Friday and Saturday during the day, we show up in our regular uniform. Uh, our riot helmets and, and all of our gear is always nearby to make sure that the officers have what they need in case uh, a, a, a peaceful situation turns uh, into something else. And so after bricks uh, were, were hailed at officers, after there were uh, frozen water bottles that began to um, come at officers when they surrounded uh, vehicles with officers inside, shaking them and breaking windows, the officers grab their, their helmets and their shields, um, and that's when the, the gear comes out. So we don't show up uh, with, with, with riot gear on. Okay. 
Um, and I guess too about the the training to Councilman Resendez, is forty hours enough uh, for de-escalation training or for any training? I mean, um, and is it every other year forty hours, or is it is it because um, it is an art to de-escalate a situation? And I think being a parent of three boys, I have figured it out hopefully, but um, but it is an art, and I think it's much needed right now that, um, you know, you, you figure in, and so I'm wondering, is that uh, training enough? So, so Councilwoman, just to be clear, they don't get 40 hours of, they got 40 hours of training every other year and four hours in that block is the escalation. Uh, wow. Or, or more depending upon uh, the, the cycle. And so okay. what we will say is we are always, an officer can never have enough training. That, that's that's that we can never have enough training and uh, we welcome the opportunity to train more a, a, a well-trained officer is a great officer is the best officer that we can put on the street and so we do welcome that uh, right now that was our cycle uh, in order to make sure that we get all 3,100 officers trained throughout a, a year because it does take time because they take 40 hours out of their uh, uh, out of their uh, work week and so or work year and so we are looking for opportunities uh, for more training we welcome them uh, it does take money to train mm -hmm. and so uh, we welcome that um, okay let's uh, so the body cams uh, I know we do we have mandatory body cams or is it and is it on for you know the whole time you're on how does the body cam situation and is that it and how can we use those to better police, I guess is the, the question. So we currently have 1500 body cameras and those are deployed through patrol as well as SWAT, narcotics and fugitives. Uh, anyone who's uh, in, interacting with the public and or making dynamic entry. Uh, this next camera contract has us at 2000 cameras and that should cover uh, all of our patrol as well as all of our K-9 gang unit uh, narcotics, SWAT, uh, and any other, other uh, uniform staff that would be making uh, uh, direct contact with the public. Okay. And are they required to wear them on the whole time they're on, on duty? So they don't, they're not required to have them in the on position when they're riding in the car, but they are required to turn them on uh, whenever there's a citizen contact. Uh, with this new uh, with the new camera contract that we have, uh, it is going to be a trigger that if they pull their weapon, uh, whenever they pull their weapon, it automatically activates the body worn camera. Got it. Okay, and then um, I know you awesome. just instituted a duty to intervene. Is there a mechanism for a reporting, um, a reporting mechanism? So, so if there is an intervention and it goes one way or another, is there a a duty to report when you have intervened or when you, and it, is there, is there going to be some uh, checks and balances on each other, I guess is the, is the better way to put it. So each individual that receives a complaint, there is a process within the department that that complaint is documented and then forwarded up through our uh, IAD division to keep uh, track of who the complaint is against what the complaint is in order for it to go into IA Pro and document for each officer uh, their history. So that process will continue to take place. Because I found it, I found it very alarming that three individuals, three adults, wouldn't step up and say, "Hey, you know, back off." And so, is that what you're talking about with a duty to intervene? Is that specific thing? And then, and so I guess I'm wondering, how do you report that? if you do it trigger that. So, so that, that is the, that's at the absolute extreme and it does include that, but it also includes any lesser offense um, or any violation of the rules and regulations and a duty for them to, uh, to report. Okay, and then finally, um, I, I agree with everybody that what we, we, what we, what we wanna do and change um, you know, um, I worked at the, in, in the state, I worked in uh, DISD and I saw what our housing policy does to our education system. And um, it's, it, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't work. We've got to change the way we do communities. And my question is, is this, 
council have the courage, does the city, does the society have the courage to do what it takes to create mixed income, mixed cultural, mixed race communities, because we've been used to this system for a long time. And, um, and it goes with the justice system. There's a book called Tulia, where it's from my area, and it talks about how their injustice of how uh, laws are meant for a certain uh, for certain individuals and other laws are meant for other individuals. And so my question to you is, are you willing to look at the justice system and make some changes there that do not put uh, people of color on a certain path that, uh, that could become harmful to them for their whole adul adulthood? That was a big question. Yeah, it's, it's a stunner. I'm, I'm <laughs> I guess maybe I would love to see us look at that, um, uh, look at how we can work with our DA to, um, I guess I should make it as a statement versus a question, work with our DA that, that, that creates a justice system that is equal for all. I know that there are um, situations where a, a, a child of color gets a different handling than a child that's um, um, of, of not of color or that's an Anglo. So um, I would love to have a look at that because I do think that we don't need to set teens up for a life that is not, um, that, that, they, that is not for them. Thank you, and that's it, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate and that is, it. you're right on time. I mean, exactly on time. Uh, District 10. District 10, District 11. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Let me get my video started up. Um, I want to um, thank you for setting this up, uh, meeting up, Mr. Mayor, and give us an opportunity to discuss with the uh, chief. Sorry with the chief and the city manager, some incidents that occurred in the last week. Um, we've heard a lot and a lot of ideas have come forward. The colleagues, um, the buck doesn't stop at the chief and the buck doesn't stop at the city manager, it stops with us. We are the people that are elected to run this city and to put the policies in place to keep our residents safe. Um, there are a few themes that I'm gonna talk to today or speak to today that I think many of you have heard in the past. But one of them, the first one is, we need to seriously consider just shutting down the police academy. If there's ever a place where brutality is institutionalized, it's when they get started and when we have non-educators, sworn officers, but not professional educators, teaching these people, quote, the Dallas way. The academy is a bastion of indoctrination into the way the unions operate, into the shadowy way that uh, officers operate outside of protocol, into it's a indoctrination into a code of silence and a code of closing ranks as opposed to a code of transparency and a code of accountability. There are plenty of edu accredited educational institutions in this city and in this uh, North Texas that can do a great job of educating officers to be public servants. But our academy is failing at that. And, and if we wanna look for, we talk about places where we can make a change, I think it's their chief, you may recall when I first, when you first arrived in Dallas, and I introduced you to one of my constituents. She went through the academy and was a Dallas police officer for a year. She was punched in the face by an instructor. She was chased out of the department for trying to report infractions such as destruction of evidence. Now, I realize that was your first month on the job to get hit with something like that. And I do not have confidence that that much has changed over there. So we need to look at that next year when this budget comes around. I think that's a big place, not only for significant savings, but also for 
uh, deinstitutionalizing, quote unquote, the Dallas way. We can do a lot better. Secondly, we need to eliminate public safety associations and unions from influencing elections. That's on us. The more, no more contributions, no more endorsements. We should pledge that. We're not going to accept those because it does influence us. And how ironic is it that, and in my view, unethical, that elected officials take money from these unions and associations and then vote on an employment contract. Really? We're going to vote on giving you a raise after you've made a big contribution to my campaign. We saw a major abuse of that in the uh, end of September when the unions pushed to go outside of an agreed to contract and get a mid contract raise and got that on the heels of a council member that was running for, uh, for mayor and other council members whose seats were in jeopardy. And they worked so hard to get those endorsements and get that money uh, and, and push through uh, 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 a tax increase on our citizens for their own personal gain to try to get votes through having endorsements of those public safety unions. We gotta put a stop to that. And, can, and colleagues, we continue to reward bad behavior. We give raises every time meet and confer comes around, big pump, big raise. I, I mean, we need to really be thinking twice about this, about how we're funding this department. We, we bailed out the fraudulent pension system on the backs of our taxpayers. But everybody's afraid to stand up to the police. Everybody's afraid to say no to them. They put me, you guys know, they put me on a fit program. It wasn't to get in shape, fit, fear, intimidation, and threats. We can't tolerate that anymore. We cannot. So when budget cut season comes around, the biggest bucket is public safety. We can't treat it like it's sacred anymore. No more. Your... Okay, sir. So I've got more, and I will pick it up. I'm oh, you got you got two more rounds. I will I will use them. Thank you. I, I could feel it coming. I could feel it. Uh, <laughs> District twelve. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, for calling this meeting. It was needed by both the community and the council members. And I want to also thank Chief Hall and TC, because I know you have been working around the clock in stressful times, along with our city staff, and that includes our police officers who are working very long, long shifts in very tense conditions. Um, Chief Hall, my first question for you is what you think you did to de-escalate this situation? So I think on multiple nights, uh, Councilwoman, uh, encouraging my staff as well as being out there personally uh, talking to the uh, some of the activists, uh, asking them to please uh, continue to be peaceful, uh, not throw things at the officers, uh, encouraging uh, the officers to, to make sure that we give them the right of road, roadway. Um, and, you know, making, making sure that we well, any any challenges that were coming up uh, as it relates to our presence and their anger and fear and all of those things. There were even protests where they asked us that we just want you to back up the last couple nights, I think Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, and yesterday, all they asked for us was to, to, to back up and not hover around them uh, and give them the space uh, to protest, and we've done that. Uh, and 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 so the relationship uh, in that space has been we were able to 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 maintain uh, that level of respect and give them that. So there's been an do you, opportunity. I'm sorry. Do you do you believe that de-escalation means um, acquiescing to what a protester wants? Is that the no, same thing to you? No, that not okay. every time. Is there are there in, instances when acquiescing? is a de-escalation tactic, absolutely, as long as it's not unreasonable, unethical, uh, or putting anyone's lives at, dang, at, at risk. And so- I understand. I feel like I was able to watch you um, quite often because there are a lot of live streams. Um, and I guess my, my, my view of it was really the first instance I saw of police de-escalation was when the officer took a knee with the protesters. I don't know that that was what was required 
to accomplish the first set of real change. Um, but that is what I saw. May I ask, when was the last time you had training in de-escalation? Well, um, it's been a it's been a while. Uh, it's 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 been a while since I've been. Uh, but I review de-escalation policies. I'm very familiar with de-escalation. Have you had it since you've been in Dallas? No, ma'am. I have not been through the actual training, but I actually reviewed the training to make sure um, that the officers uh, are receiving uh, the right training relative to what the state requires. Can you tell me who decided to use tear gas and if there were other options available? So the incident commander who's on the ground uh, makes that decision based on the circumstances and that uh, in that instance, that was the individual who's the SWAT commander. Only the SWAT team has uh, access to tear gas. They are the only ones trained to use it. And they, the SWAT commander who was the incident commander at the time uh, was the individual who made the determination based on the circumstances. So it wasn't your decision? No, it was not my decision, but I stand. Would you have made that same decision? I would have probably made that same decision. Can you tell us the racial makeup of DPD's sworn officers? So um, off the top of my head, I haven't checked probably in the last two or three weeks, but approximately 27% African-American uh, and 24 percent um, Hispanic and so 53 percent Caucasian. And city manager, can you confirm for us what the um, general population uh, demographics are for African American and Hispanic? I cannot confirm that councilwoman. I don't know that statistic. I can find it and get it for you before this evening. I don't know that. You can probably yet. Google it. Okay. So um, my next question for you is this, is um, Chief Hall, do you have reports that you regularly review that speak to DPD's interactions by race? Do I have what? I'm sorry. Do you have reports that you are looking at on a regular basis that review DPD's interactions by race? Yes, ma'am. I get a Monday morning administrative report from a, a from the admin bureau that gives me a breakdown of who's in the academy by race, uh, and also on the police on the entire police department. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not asking about um, the staff. I'm asking about your interactions with the public. Arrests okay. that were made, tickets that were given, things like that. Are you getting regular reports like that? So. We, we keep the stats on a regular basis, but and we do a end of the year racial profiling uh, report, and that's the report that I see. But do I look at that report um, every week or every month? No, but we do keep, keep stats on that. Um, the, the and I'm sorry, it's the, called the end of the year what? Racial report? Racial profiling data report. So I would like to be sent the most recent copy of that. I have a feeling my colleagues would probably like that as well. Um, and I would also suggest that that probably needs to be looked at more than once a year. I'm just going to say that. Um, we talk a lot about community policing and um, it's the middle of 2020. President Obama created the 21st Century Policing Task Force in 2014. They released their interim report in 2015, then another report in 20, I'm sorry, yeah, 2016. In 2017, National League of Cities shared the report with cities and provided training and guidance. And I'm just wondering how all of a sudden at midnight last night, we're getting our new policing, 21st century policing strategies. And why this wasn't done in 2016 or 2017 or 2018 or 2019. So I think that's that's um, kind of an unfair statement, Councilwoman. Uh, we, I've been pushing 21st century policing practices and the pillars and uh, each one of my uh, strategies for 2018 and 2019 were geared around those six pillars, uh, each one of them. And with the first page of this uh, building trust with our community uh, that you received is the six pillars and what the Dallas Police Department has worked on uh, since 20, 
2017, 2018, and 2019 and put in place that's in line with 21st century policing best practices. And if you look at the, um, uh, the Obama Use of Force Project, uh, you would see that Dallas Police Department is, has seven out of the eight uh, uh, use of force uh, things in place in the Dallas Police Department, as well as uh, some technology upgrades and, 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 and multiple other things that we've done. So we have been working off of 21st century policing best practices. Uh, and I, I just would say that um, change is not done overnight. It takes time to implement uh, program strategies and some of these things that we, we need to, to, to implement require us uh, to have uh, uh, a, a budget for. And so a lot of these implementations have been, are being worked on and they were being worked on as part of our strategy uh, and we're just moving them to the Well, I, I, I almost find it ironic that you're saying that change isn't done overnight when we get a memo in the middle of the night um, and this was all done in a week. So yeah, we could, we could be moving a lot faster. Um, Mayor, can you tell me how much more time I have? One minute, 24 seconds. Okay, awesome. Um, so I guess my, my, where I want to go with this is if you can tell us, Chief Hall, what is the difference between a priority one call and a priority two call? And if you can just give us a couple of examples of what each one is. Priority one call is a call that needs immediate attention. It's a shooting, it's a stabbing, uh, it's, you know, someone's life is in danger at that particular point in time. A, the priority two call is a disturbance where something is happening, but the imminent threat to life uh, is not, not prevalent at that particular time. So uh, an argument that's between two people, uh, an individual walking around in the backyard, uh, you know, suspicious person, those are the kinds of things that require priority to call. Okay. How has the protest situation affected our responses to priority one and priority two calls? Well, uh, it had a, a tremendous effect uh, due to the fact that we've had a number of resources uh, allocated to the protest. Uh, we have uh, multiple units from each of our substations and you know, uh, a lot of our resources are tied up uh, in, in, in handling these protests to ensure the safety of the protesters as well as the rest of the city. So it does have a, a, an impact. So I'm hearing reports that there's like 66 calls waiting to get to a priority two. Like hours go by. Do you think that's accurate? I, I would not. I would not say that that's inaccurate, Councilwoman. Uh, as I said before, we have a lot of resources uh, in the uh, downtown and surrounding uh, city area to manage the protests and some of the civil unrest that we've seen over the last few days. So that could very well be accurate. Well, um, I recognize I'm probably out of time, so I'll just wait for my next time. Thank you. Thirty-four seconds. Thirty-four seconds. Okay. Well, then I'm just going to say that I can't believe the amnesia that this council has. Um, we have increasing crime rates. We have still a whole lot less officers than we ever did. And we have very real crime that's happening. Just this morning, I'm reading the paper. There's a shootout in South Dallas in a church parking lot with a 15-year-old shot. And you want to defund the police? I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, I, I am going to pass for now, and I'll just you go are back now to out of time. Honestly. Thank you very much. District 13. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm going to begin by asking a, a few questions. I think we've had a lot of focus on the bridge. Um, and I think it's I think it's going to be important for us to hear the whole story. Um, I'm also hearing um, Chief Hall admit that they could have done things differently. Um, and I, I think that that has weighed into her decision making on dropping the charges. But I just regarding um, the bridge, um, I, I have a question about: Were there any other law enforcement agencies involved that evening? 
I know we have um, DPS here and we've had help from other uh, municipalities, uh, but that evening, did we have other um, law enforcement on the bridge? Yes, ma'am, we did. We had DPS on the bridge. How, so DPS was, was there, but there was not any other, um, like we didn't have Irving there or other municipalities represented? Not that night, not Monday. Okay. So you are under, um, I just want to um, acknowledge that you're going to do a full investigation. And if anybody was injured that evening or there's any reports of um, excessive force, um, there will be investigations relate, related to any of it. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And at, um, you should have received uh, information today that we placed two officers on administrative leave who were identified through video uh, using unnecessary force uh, um, during this weekend. We are still trying to identify what date that was. We just have the video. Right. Okay. And so, and all of the officers that are responding, our officers that are responding to um, any incidences related to protests, they all have body cam. Is that correct? No, not not all of them are assigned body cameras because they were uh, they were coming from different uh, uh, divisions and uh, there's there were also officers in that division that were on patrol. So there's not enough to have uh, every officer with a body camera at this time. Okay. Well, hopefully, I I know that's been an initiative. I think that should be a priority that when there's any interaction with the public that um, they have body cams. So. I'll look for the complete information. I don't think we're at a time where we can make um, judgment um, until we have all the information. And I think that should include um, information related to, you know, all injuries um, related to the civilians, protesters, um, any officers that could have been injured or any, any of law enforcement that could have been injured, as well as all property damage. I think when we have an assessment, on how um, the response related to um, the protests have to be inclusive of all that information. Um, so, and um, so I look forward to, um, and I don't know if it's city management, DPD, that, that we and the public are provided um, a full account of information involved um, that is inclusive of all that, all that related to the people that were impacted, um, if they were either first responders or if they were protesters, um, observers, or, and then um, I think we need to understand the whole comprehensive um, uh, amount of property damage um, that happened. Those, those are data points that we need to fully understand. So, and with that, then um, I, thanks for answering and addressing those questions. Um, and I look for the further information, but I, I just want to say, I mean, as an elected official um, and, and having the opportunity to serve over the last seven years, um, I think it's important for all of us. I mean, I know for me um, to address that, you know, George Floyd's death has brought myself and I know my entire community great grief. And it reminds us of the need for systemic change. But, and we all are part, we all have to accept and really ask ourselves, what is our responsibility um, and how can we be an agent of change? I've been grateful for the opportunity to listen to all of our speakers tonight, to the speakers um, and the input I've been able to receive as an elected official over the last seven years, um, to be able to attend protests, to be able to attend memorial events and be able to really have um, you know, have that exposure and have that input. Uh, but I also, we have to, as a body, have to take the responsibility that we, um, we unanimously approved the current budget that we're operating in, which, as well as the meet and confer, that really prioritized pub, uh, public safety. That was less than nine months ago. Um, the majority of us campaigned that we were going to make Dallas a safer place. We had a progressive uh, candidate running for mayor that actually advocated that outside of meet and confer that there was a 10% raise. And we worked, I was on that council that worked to make sure that our um, 
uh, first responders were compensated um, compensated the, the way they deserve to be compensated. And so it is, it just, um, we need to take that responsibility. If we need, and, and that meet and confer has, the, it's, I mean, we are under that agreement. But moving forward, yes, we do need to look for ways that we can help fix the, the, the issues, the, the root time, issues of our socioeconomic conditions and look for opportunities for fair and just Chair opportunities. Can I, I, I just, lastly, I would okay, just say to ahead. my colleague, I mean, we need to be consistent on our principles and we need to not sail with the current winds. So, okay. And I'll, I'll let, you. I'll, I'll. You have more rounds. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Of course, of course. Um, District 14. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A lot of the questions that I've heard from my colleagues um, have, have already addressed some of my concerns and Chief Hall's answers have addressed some of the, uh, the issues that were in my mind. But the way I look at this is I look at it as a timeline. I look at it over the last week or so, certainly since Friday, this has been an evolution. It's been an evolution for Dallas. It's been an evolution uh, for our police department. I think it's been an evolution for the protesters too. Uh, most of the damage that occurred on Friday and Saturday happened in my district. I took a tour both Saturday and Sunday through different parts of my district, and I saw areas that had been shot with bullets. I saw significant property damage, significant tagging throughout central Dallas, uptown. And I didn't like it. Um, Saturday night, I had the opportunity, if it's an opportunity, to watch the interactions of our police force as they met with protesters that I don't know what percentage, but they were definitely infiltrated with people of violence, people who um, were taking the protests a different direction than I think that the intent was. So I, I got to watch some of the militarization of the police as they interacted with violent uh, protesters, or at least potentially violent. I also got to see uh, a lot of my boarded up windows of buildings in downtown and uptown. Uh, a broken windows, and I saw a lot of buildings, a lot of businesses boarded up in concern and in fear of further violence and further property damage. By the time we got to Sunday and we had the curfew, I was out at different neighborhoods also, and the most interesting to me was the number of my neighborhoods that were not included in the curfew, including East Dallas and Greenville. Uh, the West Village area and Cedar Springs. I made a point of going around to see those neighborhoods to see what was going on, to see if they had true fear of the protesters coming and, and they did, they wanted to be included. So I saw an evolution in terms of, of violence on Friday and Saturday. I saw an evolution in terms of a curfew to try to put a, a cover on, on uh, where the damage would be to free up some of the police resources on Sunday and Monday. We get to the bridge. You know, and I've heard different things about what happened at the bridge but I think you have to think about the timeline of how we got there. We weren't really sure what the protesters were. Were they still violent? Had they changed what they were gonna do? So I, I look at this from a perspective of what the police knew and what they thought was gonna happen. I've talked to my kids. You know, there's a lot of information out there. I don't think we've done a very good job of, of telling people what really happened there. I've, I've heard the tear gas was definitely used. You know, Chief, I've heard from you tonight that, that it was smoke it was not tear gas. You've been very clear on that. You've also been very clear on, on the use or non-use, we don't know yet, of the different types of, of non-lethal, I don't know what you call the soft, soft bullets. And I look forward to seeing what, that, what really happened there, see if it, what agency it was, see how that really unfolded, see if there really was a threat. But I do understand, again, the evolution. I've made a point over the last couple of days of going to different protests and talking to different individuals. I don't feel a threat from them when I walk in. You know, I'm a 54-year-old guy. I don't look like one of the protesters. I definitely <laughs> look different. But they've been very friendly and open, and I've been able to walk up and ask them what they want. And I detected no violence, and I think they're doing a pretty good job. So that's the evolution of that protest. And I've told them very clearly that if they go back to breaking things and violence, that I, I can't hear them. That's a conversation that, that's not going to happen if they turn violent. So that's good. So I'm not so much worried um, about the evolution of the police force, because I see the police force evolving as the protesters have evolved. And Chief, 
um, I've actually been fairly comfortable with how your tactics have changed. I've seen the police pull back from these different protesters. Um, some of us have talked about lifting the curfew because the protesters have actually been nice kids walking through neighborhoods trying to have their voices heard. So I'm watching this. I'm trying to see where it's going. I'm trying to see uh, really what we can advise from a policy perspective. But what I really want to see is evolution from the police force. If the protesters have changed, then we should change too. I can go back to Saturday. I really wasn't comfortable watching our police in a military style formation. I was close enough that I actually got to smell tear gas for the first time in my life. Um, not really a pleasant experience. So um, I know a little bit about what the protesters experienced. I'll close. I'm not, I don't really have any questions, like I said. So it's really me talking about where I am in my thought process. I've gotten significant emails. I've listened to the speakers tonight. It's been influential on me as I think about what it is that the city wants, what it is that my district wants. Um, so I'm getting a lot of voices for change, for 21st century policing to engage with uh, the citizens in a way that's not quite as hostile. That's I'm intrigued by that. Um, and like I said, my last comment is that my kids have changed me on this and, and um, I'll come back later. Okay. Um, I'm going to go you back. You cut me off, is that it? No, you know, yeah, that's where you're, yeah, you are out of time. Sorry, I let you go okay. over a little bit. Um, we're going to go back to 10 and then check in at the top and then we'll be on round two. Um, 10. Mayor. Yeah. It's, it's Madrana. Yeah, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come. I'm looping back around. I'm, okay. come, I'm coming back around to get you. All right, thanks. So, yeah. District 10. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Yes. Appreciate it. Um, yes, I can hear you. I have a, a few questions um, for Chief Hall, and I really want to start by saying that um, as I've listened to the speakers and, and talked and thought through this for the last few days, I am um, very much aware of the difficult nature of this job. I, I, I do believe, Chief, you have the uh, maybe the most difficult job in this city, and over the last time, it has been even more difficult. And um, I want to tell you directly that I believe you have you are well intentioned. You have, um, in every case, you're trying to protect our citizens, and you're trying to do the best you can to navigate through this. And it has been difficult. Um, I heard your answer earlier, and I got the chance earlier this week to, to ask TC the same question. Um, but to to reaffirm that at this entire time, every every decision that you have made, um, you feel um, you stand by that decision. And if you were to do it over, you wouldn't have changed anything. Is that correct? So if I had different information maybe I would do things differently. Is that, and that's, that's what I'm saying. All of the information I don't have. I don't have all of the information from the bridge because there's still video that we're trying to compile. And, but so if I see something on the bridge that we did wrong, I am willing to make those necessary changes. I will acknowledge where we're wrong and do things different. I'm committed to that. Uh, but with the information that I had at the time uh, that I made the decisions, I do stand by those decisions. And so part, part of my concern has been, and this really goes back to the beginning, and it is really, the, from, my, from my own personal perspective, the lack of understanding or awareness of what the overall strategy was in each incident. And I've, I've heard some of the comments and understand that, that you, you did change tactics from day to day based on different information, which is understandable. Um, but the, the big picture items, I, you know, Friday night, um, you made the decision to go out into the field. Um, when did you make that decision? I started in the field, sir. Um, at, when the protest began outside of headquarters, I was standing outside of headquarters on the other side of the street, as was uh, many of the officers. Most of the you know, command staff was just kind of you know, um, just monitoring, letting them know that we were there uh, in support. I mean, this situation touched all of us. We all felt the pain uh, that the protesters were feeling at that time. And we were all kind of in the area, uh, 
and, and, and support uh, for a peaceful protest. And so I was on the street the entire time. Uh, we were uh, behind the protest, uh, walk, uh, driving along to make sure um, that everything was safe. Uh, keeping in mind, Councilman, that we, we were watching other cities uh, being set on fire, uh, individuals being injured, officers being injured. So my concern was to make sure that everything was, was peaceful and that uh, we were uh, tactically ready that if something and, were to And Chief, yes, I, I understand. And at some point in time, the, the situation changed, right? It became not a peaceful protest, is that correct? Yes, sir. And was it in close proximity to you or was it somewhere further away? It was in close prox proximity um, to me. I was probably maybe 30, 40 feet away from the um, individual who received a rock through the windshield uh, from, a, from a distance. And then at, at what point was it that the tear gas was released? Um, it was, I was standing out, we were standing out uh, trying to de-escalate the situation, ensuring that everyone was heard and understood. And then uh, more bricks and more rocks came over um, people were pushing, yelling, screaming, uh, and then uh, uh, DPD made the decision, the squad commander, based on things that were going on all around the area, because the area we were in, they were throwing rocks, but they were also beginning to break things in other locations, and uh, the squad commander de determined to, to deploy tear gas uh, a little way away from us. And then is it fair to say that the tear gas caused the people and, and protesters and everybody to kind of disperse? Yes, that was the, go the goal and it, and it allowed them to disperse. And, and keep in mind, a brick came directly at me. And uh, the, the, that was the, the uh, kind of the officers are saying they're, uh, they're throwing bricks and they're throwing bricks even at the chief as she's trying to escalate, so yes. And once that dispersed, then we ended up with, in some cases, the rioting and chaos and, and what ensued with the property damage and a lot of other things. Is that right? So I, I just want us to keep in mind that this wasn't just happening in the area that I was in. The area that I was in was experiencing um, some chaos, but there was chaos going on in other areas at that same time and officers had began uh, to call out that these things were happening on the radio. Okay, I, it's just like part of part of my issue is, you know, I, and I heard you talk about it after the fact, and I was, you know, one of the issues has been just communication of when things happened and how things happened. Quite honestly, I was, I was concerned about your safety, and when I heard that, that you know, you were in the middle of it, I, part of me is, is encouraged by that because I have that same mentality. I want to be right there on the front. I want to be there, but. It may not be the best decision for the, the chief to be there when that happens. That could have been part of what um, instigated some of this activity, or at least causing some of it. And then the way it went forward, I, there's mixed messages that come from that because I, I've heard you several times that, you know, you're not, we will not tolerate, um, you know, people causing damage and issues and things like that, criminal activity. Um, but then also you were you were touting that we arrested a very few number that night. And so those things kind of don't align necessarily. But but the, the point of it is, is then the next night we're looking at we need to be we have clarity around what the message is the, everybody who's peacefully trying to protest needs to know the rules of engagement. And I, I don't feel like I knew the rules of engagement. I heard things like we we're going to make sure and fight for and stand with everybody's right to people peacefully protest, but then the actions don't match that. And then we see other instigation and other incidents, and it, it just leads to other problems. It, it goes back to, and one other area of question I just want to ask now is when we decided or when, the, when, when you decided to use a curfew, um, at that moment, you, you, you decided that on Sunday, if I remember correctly, and then there's a, a time period where you have to plan for what happens. And, and I'm assuming at that point, you know that there's a chance that people might not honor the curfew and we might have to deal with hundreds of people that are violating the curfew. Is that right? So, so no, sir, we were evaluating the curfew on Saturday. 
Um, but in on order Saturday. Us, on Saturday, and in order for us to enact the curfew, we had to make sure that we had uh, all the, the tools in place. We wanted to make sure that we had proper uh, mass uh, arrest procedures in place, it. processing, yep. and, and I got all you. Of but, and, and so you did that, and then you put it in place on Sunday, and you put together your plans or your strategies for how to deal with the situation if it was if we ended up with a bunch of people violating that that um, curfew, correct? So the plans for how we're going to do that is done. That's pre. We do a operations plan every day as we get information relative to uh, protest. If we have information about the organizer, how many people, all of those things, and our plans are geared around that. What area are they going to be in? What are the vulnerabilities, the vulnerability points uh, of that particular area? But those things evolve. And if the, the uh, organizers or the protesting group does not provide us with that information or they fail to post it on social media to, for us to be able to see what the numbers are going to be, um, that then creates uh, uh, an opportunity for us to have to kind of uh, pivot or, or um you know, make those decisions on the fly. So it's not an absolute science. Absolutely. And and so when, you, when you're preparing for that, you have to think, okay, there's a good chance we're going to have a, a lot of folks violating curfew, and the decision has to be made. Are we going to plan on arresting the folks? Are we going to issue citations? Are we going to take some other uh, diversionary tactic or what that is? You have to plan for that. And yet on Monday when this, this happens and – you know, we can go sequence in time. We've kind of went through that on when everybody gets to the bridge and there's this decision that we're going to make, we're going to make all these arrests. It, it hadn't even been coordinated with the county. It hadn't been, you know, maybe it had been coordinated with DART because I did see the, the bus pull up to start loading people up. And, and it, then it seemed like now all the decisions are being made on the fly. <coughs> Sorry, Chairman, I, I, that I, is your last question. I would like to I would like to acknowledge that, sir. Um, I think that's an accusation because there was conversation with the sheriff who had stated that she had made a, a, a room even in the basement level of the jail for our arrest. At the time that we made the arrest, um, there was another individual who told us that their capacity was an issue. He tweeted capacity was an issue. He texted that capacity was an issue. And it is not my responsibility as the chief of police to uh, to get in the middle of, of county, uh, you know, leaders and determine who's right and who's wrong. Uh, and so we made the decision at that time to process them, to to identify each one of them, and then uh, uh, release them and file charges at a later date. Okay. Well, it, so it changed on you, I guess. No, I'm sorry, your, your time your plan. time's expired, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sorry, we have to go. Next round, um, District Two, David Mayor Pro Tem. All right, uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, first off, I would just want to thank uh, the Mayor for calling this meeting. I think it's important for us to be able uh, to hear from the community uh, and listen to their uh, requests for change, uh, which I believe we do need. I do support um, uh, the change that they're asking for, um, uh, but just uh, also. Um, I've been out, and I don't know if uh, I know several council members know, but um, since Saturday night, I've been to uh, every protest that was in the downtown area. I was out um, at the bridge. I was out in Deep Ellum. I was out uh, uh, on Saturday night when uh, the vandalism was occurring. I saw it firsthand, um, you know, Deep Ellum being vandalized uptown. Uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't believe it. I, I, it was like it was a movie. There was... Um, trash cans on fire. It, it, it seemed unreal, and it was really sad to see that happening in the city that I grew up in. Um, but I wanted to be there. I wanted to be there firsthand. I wanted to know what was going on. Uh, I wanted to see how the police were treating folks uh, after the Friday incident. I wanted to uh, to be able to uh, talk about it, to be able to say, hey, I was there. I know exactly what was going on, um, and uh, that's why I was there. Um, was it the smartest thing? Probably not. <laughs> We were in a vehicle that got bricks thrown at, at, at us um, at one point. Uh, well, luckily, you know, nothing happened and we're safe. Um, uh, but uh, I also want to talk about the bridge and what I saw and what I witnessed. I was at the bottom of the bridge uh, when I rolled up on the scene. Uh, I was there from the beginning. Uh, Councilmember Azadua was on the bridge. 
And um, I know that we're talking about um, the tear gas and what was uh, deployed or what wasn't or the rubber bullets that were, that were shot at, at people. Um, I actually happened to be next to Chief Hall when the call came in from the incident commander asking if approval to release gas. And Chief Hall said several times, do not release gas. So I want to know who released the gas because they obviously um, disobeyed a command. Um, but I was there several times when she said, do not release gas. I never heard, I was there all night. Um, and I also did not hear um, uh, her give the commands to fire bullets into the crowd. So that's something that we need to get to the bottom of. Um, uh, and I'm sure that you heard her saying she's reviewing video, she's reviewing tapes. Uh, but I was there that night. Uh, I talked to several protesters once they came off the bridge and asked them about, I asked them, why did they go on the bridge? You know, the bridge was not shut down. That was not the route. It, there was cars going 60, 70 miles per hour on that bridge when they were on their way up. Uh, the cops had to stop traffic. Um, and they told me that they thought it was approved. They didn't have a route. They were not given a route. So they thought it was an approved route. So that's why I supported and advocated for them. And it was a lot of them. They did not know. It, they thought it was an approved route. Um, to uh, for you guys to drop the charges. Um, so uh, that's why I advocated for that. Um, the route was, uh, I, was, I was told was supposed to be up and down riverfront, um, going up and down riverfront in front of the courthouse. Uh, and so that's what I expected to see. Um, so that's my account. I was there firsthand. I actually was next to Chief I, I, I'm, and heard her say, not to release the gas. Um, so I want to make sure that the truth gets out there that I heard firsthand. Um, and I hope, Chief, that you are going to find out who disobeyed these commands. And, I, and, I, and, and that's um, going to take some time. I know that you're still looking at the videos. Um, so um, that's all I really have. I just wanted to tell my side of the story um, and to let people know that I was there firsthand at all these protests that were downtown from Saturday until um, Monday and, and, and others. So um, that's, I just wanna say that I know that um, we are gonna move toward change. I wanna thank the city manager for trying to address some of those. I think it's the beginning uh, and we got a lot more work to do, uh, but I'm here and I'm really willing to work with everyone that wants to be a part of this change. Uh, again, thank you. District four. Yes, let me just start off, <clears throat> excuse me, to the public, uh, to the public, to the council. Uh, of course, I want to acknowledge the staff. Uh, I must tell you, this is a very difficult meeting meeting for me. I don't think I've ever been a, a part of this type of conversation before. Well, I said that why, why I'm at the horseshoe. I had to do a lot of praying. That's why I couldn't go the first round. Uh, you know, I, of course, continue to reflect on 846 and all the prayers and all the rhetoric we've, we've had about moving forward and trying to be fair and all of that. So it took me a while to be able to speak tonight. In addition to that, of course, I had to not only keep 846 in my mind, I'm continuing to think about inequities, racism, sexism, social injustice, black inequality, black uh, sexism, uh, against black women, and I have to talk about that. All of that's going through my mind, and, and I'm trying to get to the, this point and get and move on so that others can can speak. And so I just kind of I want to say two things straight up so that my time doesn't run out. What we're talking about today is beyond tweets, Facebook, Instagram, photo ops, campaign commitments. We're here now talking about the future of this country. We're now here also talking about the future of the chief of police and the city manager. And what I'm gonna tell you, chief, I've been praying, I'm gonna continue to pray for this whole council and I'm gonna ask the council to pray for your communities and pray for this city. And to chief and to the city manager, I'm gonna tell you like they tell me in my household, 
and my upbringing. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. So you're going to have to hang tight, stand strong, because for every there's a season for everything. And God puts on us a certain pressure, and if it doesn't kill you, it's going to make you stronger. And it's going to be the same for me. If whatever we're going through right now as a public official, it's not gonna it's not gonna kill me. It's gonna make me stronger because of my commitment. And so it's two things I think we should have at least allowed to happen today. And I've heard a couple of you say it. We have what's now. And I'm gonna tell the public like it is. We have a public inquisition. We should at least allow the chief of police to complete her investigations. She's now here on trial. We're asking her about magazine reports, the magazine, whatever other magazines and tweets and what have you. And she's having to pull from, from, from her memory. Now we know we are under a lot of pressure and a lot of stress and emotion. I have cried, I have cursed, I have pleaded, I have, I'm contemplating, all of that. She's come out of a, of a ride where she was about to be hit with a brick. She could have been killed as well. But all of that emotion, all of us are hot wired right now. So I'm gonna tell you that it's unfair to put her out here publicly without her having the benefit of the investigation of additional details. I appreciate uh, Mr. Madrano from bringing up the fact that there are more details and what he heard. All of this should have been brought out uh, before we are here with this inquisition. Because I had to ask myself, what is the true intention of this particular hearing? And so I'm going to tell you, I think it's injustice on the highest for her to be here trying to pull answers out of the cloud and she doesn't have all of the facts. And so I want the listening public to know what you're witnessing right now is beyond the protests. A matter of fact, it's beyond some of the other conversations you're bringing to the table. The real deal here, and y'all don't have to agree with me because I know it. I have the experience. Just like I understand black injustice, social injustice, I understand that what we're doing now, we're participating in a setup against Chief Hall and Mr. T.C. Broadnax. And I'm appalled, I'm insulted. Do we have the right to do, do, are we supposed to do our job? Yes, I agree with those who have said that. Most, most definitely we should do our job. We have taken an oath to the, to the citizens. And I'm not being biased in the sense of me not wanting to deal with the issues I do. But if I'm here tonight, I don't even have all the issues. I don't even have all the answers to give to my community. And I'm sitting here now participating because at this point, the other feeling that I have about a black woman being lynched, being lynched, that's how I feel. Because I have been where she is to a certain extent. Because I'm treated differently because I'm a woman. Should she be able to handle her job because she's the chief of police? Yes. But her, the scar that she bears is that she's a black, strong woman. And so she has to endure this. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Because the, because the, the plot thickens. And so, so what I'm going to hear is that your time, that ma'am. Thank you. Just stay woke. I'll That's be back for another time. round. Yes, we will have round two in just a moment. Let me see if there's anybody who didn't go. In the first round, I think we have gone through everyone in the first round. So I will start off the second round with the question for the chief. Chief, what what what's in smoke? What is, we keep talking about smoke, and we're we're talking about um, you know smoke and tear gas as though tear gas and smoke are you know two very different things. So explain to us what what is smoke? What do we what do we mean when we say that smoke was used? What is that chemically? What is that? So smoke is used as a diversionary um, tool, um, and that was... What's in uh, it? I mean, what is it? Not how it's used. What's, what is it? I, I don't have the chemical breakdown at my hand. It's smoke. I mean, it's, it's smoke. I, I don't know what the chemical breakdown of smoke would be. I'm, it does okay, not so get in anybody's breath. It doesn't... It's just... It just clouds the air uh, to, to, to make sure that we can distract the individuals um, from... Uh, any activity that they were moving towards. So or to describe whatever was released on the bridge as something that caused people's eyes to be irritated. Smoke canisters which irritated people's eyes were released. Uh, one of the people said who was on the bridge in the Dallas Morning News article. Um, 
the people who thought it was tear gas um, were saying that they saw it, smelled it, anguish screams around me from those with burning eyes. So that that's why they thought it was tear gas. So I'm asking, so we're, we're saying, okay, it's not tear gas as though it's not a chemical. What is it? I mean, if it's causing people to describe whatever it was that was released on the bridge as something that caused anguish screams around me from those with burning eyes, um, what, I mean, so smoke is still a chemical, is that right? It's not like it's nothing, is that right? I mean, it's something. It's causing people to have burning eyes and irritating Mayor, eyes. Is that Mayor, right? I, Mayor? Yes? I, yeah. Thank you. I, th I think the chief has responded that she does not know the chemical makeup and or do you know side that? effects. Or I do not either. So. Okay, thank you. I'm moving on to another question now. Um, so, Chief, while I was watching the looting that was going on um, on Friday night and the property damage that was going on on Friday night downtown and in Deep Ellum from the Emergency Operations Center, which is where I was watching it from on Friday night, and I saw no response by the police that night um, to the looting that I was seeing in real time, which I found very surprising, so surprising that I actually asked the folks in the EOC. I was there with some, some folks from DFR, a, a couple of DPD and my staff, and Rocky Vaz was there for a while. I asked uh, folks, is this normal? I said, is this how we normally respond um, to situations like this, to just sort of watch people um, break into store after store. I saw people break into Neiman. I saw in real time on screen, people breaking into stores like Neiman Marcus, Traffic, 7-Eleven, um, I believe. And I actually, in, at some point, reached out to you and asked you about why we weren't doing anything. Can you explain to everyone here what you explained to me about why uh, we had no real police response to the looting that was going on that night? So, Mr. Mayor, uh, as I told you that night that I was on the ground, but what I, what I was, was responding to you as well as I'll respond to anybody, could it have been that there was so much looting and so much violence and so much destruction that our resource, it, it out-resourced us? And, and that is what, what we need to remember. There was- I was actually referring to the reference to not being prepared for it because you weren't expecting it. So, so that I never told you that I was not respecting that, Mr. Mayor. I never, I never made that statement. To you didn't. You I, never I, said that. You, based on Dallas's prior history with protests and demonstrations, you had no reason to believe that there would be looting. Sir, I never spoke to you. We text. I never talked to you on the telephone. I'm saying, so you, I'm saying you, you, you never, I, you never said that. No, sir. That was so not. The, I mean, the, the next, so the next day, you never said that. Mayor. No, sir. Okay. No, sir. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm asking the questions of the chief. No. Well, I'm 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 the chief's boss. I, but I, I, but your you question the conversation. I'm sorry. Her, you're, you're out of order, Mr. No, city back manager. Back and forth no, no, about whether you're, she's you're telling the truth. Order. Or not. I, don't, I, manager, I think it's disrespectful, mayor. No, you're out of order. I'm, I'm the fine. presiding it's officer. This questioning is out of order. No, it, you don't get to determine my questions. I, I work for you. Know, no, sir, this is the mayor form. This is the mayor council anymore. form of government. You do not this need to determine the questions I ask of someone before the council. You're out of order, Mr. Broadnax. And so mayor, are you, Mr. Broadnax. You are out of order mute with her this microphone. Tape. Mute, mute her microphone and mute his. I, you can't mute me. Yes, you can. And I'm you, sick and of you this. will. So the next question I have is how many arrests did we make that night? Let's just let's ask a factual question. How many arrests did we make? On Friday night, See, approximately thirty-one arrests we made that night. Okay. My next question. Um, I spoke to DISD trustee Maxie Johnson, and he told me, and it's reported in this article in the Dallas Morning News as well that among those who were also trapped on the bridge was Dallas Independent School District Trustee Maxie Johnson. As smoke began to cause panic among the crowd, Johnson grabbed kids he recognized to pull them away from the haze. So it's your own testimony today and according to this article, there were kids on the bridge for sure. So this is what I'm gonna say about that. And then I'll turn it over 
I have quite a bit of time, but I'll, I'll yield it. Uh, to, I'll say this. I think that it's absolutely unacceptable that on Friday, after an incident that occurred on Monday, that we still don't know whether or not what we are calling less than lethal bullets, some people are calling rubber bullets, uh, call them whatever you will. I think it's absolutely unacceptable that by Friday, after a Monday incident involving nearly 700 people, or however many people were out there, that we still don't know the answer and that you cannot tell us whether or not less than lethal bullets were fired at peaceful protesters that included children. I think that's something we should know by now. As of Friday, it's been a week. So I do find that unacceptable, and I wanted to say that because these are people who were on this bridge peacefully protesting. We've established that, and it's beyond comprehension to me that as of Friday, we still don't have the answer to those basic questions. So with that, I'll go back to District 1. So, so I would just like to say that mm -hmm. every individual out there was not wearing a body camera. We're relying on the community as well as Air One and any other studio that was present in that area to be given to us. And so with that, uh, we are waiting for that information to come through. If every officer out there was equipped with a body camera, we would have that information, but they weren't. Okay. And so this is an ever evolving situation. And I understand, Mr. Mayor, that there are some concerns and we feel uh, the pain of the community and we understand uh, that there may have been some things that transpired, but until I'm able to get a true assessment of exactly what happened on that bridge, I mean, just because it's printed in the newspaper does not make it law. And so until I'm able to verify okay. all of the accounts of that evening, uh, I am not able to give you a full assessment. Okay. Thank you. District 1. District 2. District 3. Yes, Mr. Mayor. After hearing several comments made by my colleagues, I think we have to honor the fact that the voices of those who came down and spoke. Public safety means different things to different communities. In some communities, due to a lack of trust, more police means less safety. There are new ways of policing communities that do not require a police presence. We need to be open to truly understanding this moment when there are more white young adults at a Black Lives Movement rally than black, something different is going on in this city and in this country. We cannot ignore this moment and what is going on. This is not a temporary win. I truly uh -huh. believe this was a, we woke up uh, some sleeping giants who will not go back to sleep. Majority of those who came down to speak today live in, they, they make up Dallas. They are, they represent Dallas. We have to respect that. In light of this discussion, I do not believe we will be able to say when we take our vote on the budget in September that we have a unanimous vote because the winds have shifted and we have to look at doing things differently. We have to consider the importance of reimagining public public safety. Just because we reallocate some dollars for public safety has nothing to do with the city not continuing to be safe, with us not having enough police officers to police this city. There are many ways in which we can effectively police our city and address the underlying issue, which is the historical lack of resources for a community of black and brown people. That's what this whole discussion was about. Many people had concerns with what took place in terms of the protest and policies are being changed. 
administratively, the chief determines those policies along with the city manager. The city council does not determine those policies. So we have to respect the charter and how the charter is established. I will say once again, we have to listen to the voices of those who came down to speak today. I promise you, this will be not be the last time we will hear from them. They are awake, they are energized, and they want to see real change. And real change happens with the budget and the allocation of resources. And I encourage my colleagues. Okay, that is your time, Chairman Thomas. We'll have another round, District 4. Thank you so very much. I just want to encourage all my council members once again to continue. I know some folks don't want to pray, and they say, let's do more than just pray. But let's pray about what we're doing. Uh, and I'm going to pledge to y'all tonight, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure the public is fully aware of what we're doing now. And I'm going to continue to fight for my voice. And I know I didn't quote the correct rules so that I would not have to be muted. But I, as my, my constituents say, when you mute me, you mute them. And so District 4 is not going to be muted, and we're not going to participate in crimes against Chief Hall and Mr. Broadnax. Thank you. District 5. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief Hall, I had another question that's still related to training. I'm wondering about uh, implicit racial bias training. Does any of that occur? Yes, sir. We recently um, implemented uh, with alongside of Peru, Peru Police Institute and UNT Dallas, uh, a implicit bias curriculum. Uh, we started at the top of the organization uh, about a year, it's been about a year and a half ago now. Uh, actually, Mr. Fortune, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Magoo, uh, they were actually in that first class where we uh, trained the, the top of the organization so that we could push it all the way down and let the officers understand that it was so important that we started with ourselves. In that implicit bias training, uh, it lays out biases from every angle, not just black, white, race, it's education, it's in employment, and in so many things. And in it, it forces the individuals that are participating uh, to identify their biases so that we can work to mitigate through that, recognizing that everyone has biases. So that training is ongoing uh, currently in the department. Uh, we initially rolled it out with uh, some train the trainer within the department and we were implementing it in small groups. It's also been rolled into four. Uh, and due to COVID training, uh, we are moving it to a virtual training. Okay, great, that's, that, that's good to know. Um, that's the only question I have for you, Chief. Um, and I, I just also wanna mention just more broadly um, that I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that more police is the solution to, to crime. Uh, and that's actually what I ran my campaign on. Um, we talk about equity all the time. We, the, the, the problem is that we're not actually putting those resources in the communities that have been redlined in this city. We lead, we're a leader in the nation in childhood poverty. We're a leader in, in terms of segregation, economic segregation in this, in this um, city. So putting that many resources in the public safety uh, budget it, it's not working. So, so I, I just have an issue with us being not being open-minded enough to at least consider other ways we can utilize those resources that can truly have a long-term impact in the lives of the folks in our in our city. Thank you. District six. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm I'm troubled right now <clears throat> as far as what we were originally supposed to be here to do. Um, and I lost lights in my office, but I can still speak. You know, I'm, I'm gonna say what I was gonna say for offline, because this is a really tough issue that we're all struggling with here at the Dallas, here in the city of Dallas, whether you're a council member or you're a resident in our city. And we have to be able to listen to each other and speak to each other and have a dialogue with each other in order for all of us to be able to have the opportunity to get the facts and to be able to know what's going on in our city. We owe that to our public. 
We owe that to the residents that live here in the city of Dallas. And what I just witnessed a little bit ago, I, I, have, not, I have never seen before. But what I will say is that I will continue to keep fighting so that the voices of this city can be heard and the voices of my colleagues can be heard and the voice of the city manager can be heard as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. District 7. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, TC, I have uh, some questions. Uh, first, I wanted to just address before I, I, I forget um, the, um, the curfew. I would like to uh, request for you to, uh, to, to talk to, um, I, guess, I guess I'd like to order you or direct you to speak to the chief about um, letting uh, curfew expire uh, tomorrow, please. Close the door, sir. Council. You see your your line is on. Hello. The question was for TC, wasn't it? Yes. My time shouldn't be running right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilman. Yep. I'm allowed to speak. Yes, you yeah. are allowed to oh, speak. Okay. The question was addressed to you. Yeah, I yeah. want to address the Just question. Just making sure. You. Yeah, well, um, you had a question well, addressed I'll get to, to that point in a time. second. Okay, uh, so I will talk with the chief uh, about lifting the curfew. I, I think I'm hearing from at least several council members that they think it might be appropriate. Uh, yes. And so I will talk with the chief uh, later this evening. Okay, uh, and, thank and, you, TC. We'll come I, I, I don't have much. I want to keep going. Uh, I, was, I want to say thank you to Ms. Arnold for calling tonight what it is. Um, because I, I have another question, TC. Under emergency orders, how much notice is needed to call an emergency meeting? Uh, I'd have to defer to the city attorney, uh, but 72 hours is typically uh, the timeline. But, uh, but, but I, an think emergency, it, I think emergency there's another orders, procedure. It's yes, not I needed. Think, yes, I'll yes. defer to Chris Queso. So the, the fact that we're having this an entire week after these riots broke out and the fact that I just heard from Chief Hall that we have um, not, you know, that she had not had even a phone call from the mayor. I, I find it really hard to uh, support a notion that we are going to pin any blame on any one, uh, because I, I know just as Medrano said, I was out there and I believe that leadership means to be there. And um, when we uh, have had communication, I spoke to the chief almost every single day and multiple times of the day, uh, a day this week. And so I think that that's very unsettling. Um, I, I would like to ask um, that uh, proper, proper procedure um, with, when we were told with directing, to, uh, directing our question to you, um, I, I just want to say that as far as rules and procedures, I don't know if it's proper to do a point of order, but we need to, we came here to speak. We came here to listen and we came here to hear. And if, if, if the, if those who, if, if the buck stops um, past Chief Hall, as was mentioned at TC earlier, I think it's completely unproductive to stop him from talking. And I think right now is probably a really good time to stop with the politics across the board. Um, I would like to just go ahead and lay out some policy recommendations that I have. I think that going forward, we need to prohibit covert surveillance. That's, uh, it needs to include helicopters, license plate track, uh, tracking, cell phone, uh, cell phone surveillance, et cetera, um, as a first means That's your time, in Mr. protest. Bazzardo. That's your time. Thank you. District 8. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, citizen, you know, community. Uh, we are here to, I am here to represent the city. And, and what we are trying to accomplish, um, first, we need to get the facts together. And, and TC, um, I think that what is that timeline going to be next week? Uh, make sure that every person who spoke, every person who had a question, Every council member who had a question, make sure those questions are addressed. Uh, I do have concern uh, when we had a protest in downtown that in District 8 in the southern part of Dallas, we did, did not have the resources 
and 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 to be brief, and we did lose the the citizen district because of crime, because of not protected in the black neighborhood. So I understand that we have protests, uh, but policy and governance is, is what we have to put in place. And only way you learn, you learn from mistakes. If you do make mistakes, you learn from a mistake and you sure we as a council member who make policy, we as council members who make policy, we listen to the community and the community came out here for us to listen to. We don't have to make adjustment and, and, and answer a question tonight, but we owe them a timeline in the future to make sure we address all of the questions. Because we are in the city of Dallas, big D, city of Dallas. And, and we are elected to represent them, the citizens, to our best of our ability. Tonight is, a, is an exercise that I'm waiting on you, I'm a city manager, to fill me in and the citizens in with all the questions that have been addressed here. And with that, God bless everybody. God bless America. And we are safe here. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you, District 9. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to ask our city manager if there's anything else he would like to add. I, I would like to hear what he had to say, if there was anything else that uh, he needed to cover, and I would love to give my time to him. Mr. Broadnack. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, thanks, Councilwoman. I appreciate that. Listen, I, I just want to be very clear, uh, particularly as it relates to, I think, the events over the last several days. Um, not only are we in the middle of a coronavirus pandemic, uh, but the events that we all witnessed on TV uh, really were shocking uh, and concerning. And no matter how far away they are, you've got people here in Dallas uh, willing to come out and, and fight for what they believe is right. We saw a myriad of examples of that over the last seven days. Unfortunately, on a few nights, there was some rioting and property damage. Uh, and I think our police uh, did a great job responding to that in the manner appropriate. Uh, again, as the chief said, reflection is always something we'll do uh, if we want to look backwards uh, on things and find a way to understand what we could have done differently. And I think she's going to do that. Uh, I think hearing the voices tonight of all the residents, I think I will commend the mayor. It was the right thing to do. Uh, but what I believe was the wrong thing to do uh, is to begin to ask the chief questions about things that she has not fully investigated based on third hand information and or reporting. I don't think it was fair. I do believe the questioning, the line of questioning to the chief uh, was very different than what I've ever heard coming from council members and or mayor uh, in my 25 year history of local government. And I do believe there is some confusion between what we do here around this dais and how we function and how we talk to staff. It's different from the state legislature. And so that's different, I get it. Uh, but the reality is, as it relates to me being able to speak on behalf of my employees, since I am the city manager, since they do work for me, I can speak on behalf of any employee that works for this city. And so again, it's disrespectful to her, disrespectful for me to be muted when I'm trying to have a conversation about what is right or wrong with my employees. And again, whether people enjoy me around them or not, I am the city manager. I run this city in concert with the mayor and the city council and the 13,000 employees that report directly to me. We will review this issue. We will understand better how we move forward. But no one is talking about what we have tried to do. Council Member Mendelson brought it up. Apologize for the hour. The question was asked, why was it then at 12 o'clock? Because we were working until 12 o'clock. Why were the things the that I outlined? That's the balance of Ms. Blackman's time. And I will say this. Um, I think you're confusing running the city with running the meeting. 
I'm the presiding officer of the meeting. I maintain order in the meeting. I was in the middle of a line of questioning under the balance of my time. I get time to ask questions and you don't get to jump in. No member does gets to jump in and talk over another member while they're exercising their right as an equal member of this body to ask questions. You don't have the authority from anywhere to censor my <laughs> questions and tell me I'm asking questions that, that you don't like the source of, you don't like the fact that I'm asking questions based on reporting from the Dallas Morning News and D Magazine. That's not your role. That's not your responsibility. It is my job to maintain order in the meeting. And that's a fact. And just because you didn't like where the questioning was going or the intensity of it or whatever else you liked about it, you didn't like about it, it's not your role. And so you can say as many times as you'd like, you run this city, you don't run this meeting. You are not the presiding officer of the meeting. I am the presiding officer of the meeting. That is given to me under the charter as the person who's elected to be in place 15, the mayor. You can read it in black and white. And so no, no member around here, no, none of you will ever be told by a staff member or an employee of this city when you have an election certificate hanging on your wall where you were put here by the people, by an employee that works for you that you can't talk anymore or that you can't ask that question. That won't happen. The presiding officer can tell you that because that person is also elected and given that responsibility. So to clarify, that's my job. You can say you run the city and that's a debate we can all have another time about what that phrase means and what that was intended for. But what is clear is that I'm the presiding officer and I run these meetings and that you are supposed to be actually my sergeant at arms that enforces my orders. And there has never been a legislative body in history that I have heard of of any type where the sergeant at arms who works for the presiding officer is telling the presiding officer what he or she can't do to maintain order. So please, please respect the role that I've been given under the city charter to run this meeting. And with Mayor, that, this, can I respond? I, 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 no, quick. you really can't, because that is a statement of decorum. It's not a debate point. And I'm Mayor, moving, I'm not, on, I, I'm I, moving I, on now to District 11, so we can wrap up this conversation. I, I see. I hope some, everyone else is as embarrassed as I am. So let this is turned on into to District 11. You are out of order as well. I don't care if I'm out of order. Point Black of order matters. Point of order. We are getting to the rules, civil discourse, and you are talking about politics. I'm going to suspend the rules. Mr. Mayor, did we skip District 10? Sorry, District 10. Go ahead. You're recognized. You're recognized for three minutes. District 10. We have a motion on the floor to suspend the rules. I'm not, I'm, rec I'm not recognizing the motion. I'm recognizing Mr. Magoo we to finish. Need one of the oh, that's hard to make a We are having a discussion. This, we this are is having a, this is a, a mayor council form of government. On an agenda item. This is a mayor District form. 10. This is a mayor count. This is a manager form of government. Mute the microphone Fifteen again. members of council. Um, District 10, go ahead. You know, this is, this is, this is a tough experience. What I'm hearing is a, a group of people that are tired, that are hurt, that are struggling, that are trying to represent their community, the people that put them here, and that are trying to do it in the best way that they know how. Um, everybody is on this journey, and I wish we could get together on this journey. There's stuff that we have to do as, as duty and responsibility. Um, you know, I, I don't like any of this right now. It's a struggle. Um, but I do, I, I want to echo the words of, of Chairman Thomas, who talked about the, the positives of what we see in some of the, the protests and the groups that are coming together of all, all shapes, sizes, and cultures and backgrounds that um, I do believe are awakened in a way that's different than it has been before. I believe that that's the start of some progress that we're all going to be able to, to be part of and lead through. Um, I want to echo the part where Ms. Arnold was talking about prayer. I believe that's part of what we, those of us that believe need to do and continue to do. 
I, I believe that this is, um, there's going to be big changes coming from what's going on in our city. And, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to this discussion continuing in a productive way with all parties. Um, we do have a job of oversight. We have to ask some of the after action questions. Um, I hope that that will help flesh out decisions that were made that um, maybe need to be different in the future, maybe lead to a lot of what we've heard of some policies that need to be um, changed, reformed, improved, whatever the case may be. I hope that that process starts. I hope you all got the memo I sent for our public safety committee meeting on Monday. I, I, the intention there is for each one of us on the committee to be able to, to start taking what we heard tonight, what we've heard from each other, what we've heard through the protests, and, and really, some of you have already started the list, part, putting together those particular priorities that we need to address um, as a city to make it safer for each and every citizen, every resident, every person bleeding all the same blood in this community. So um, I will, I, I, I wanna address some other questions, um, but I'll do it at a later time. And I think uh, for the most part, maybe just one more question for, for Chief Hall and I just don't know the answer. Have, have we ever had um, a sort of a third party audit, um, maybe city of, city of Dallas audit from the auditor's office or in some way somebody looking at um, the, the current procedures we have in whether it's in through internal affairs or whatever in DPD to look at how we root out any problems that may be there from some of the things we hear that, that our steps want to be taking, but to make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to address any issues within our department. Chief Paul. Sorry. I'm sorry, I missed some of that, sir. Which, what was the, the, end of the, question, the question is, um, have we, or do you know of a process where we have a third party, like such as the city auditor that can look into proactive means for rooting out other issues or, or analyzing our current internal affairs processes or anything else that even Citizens Police Review Board that, that we have we gotten that kind of feedback from a third party or from a city auditor and what would that process look like? Or is that even something you would, you would recommend? So um, I'm sure that we can look into that. The uh, current Office of Oversight has the ability to uh, review policy, uh, some of our general orders, they go through and look at all of our critical incidents and use of force and the monitor has been uh, attached to, to our hips since she's been here. So she's looking at uh, how we process investigations, how we go through them, through our IAD. She meets weekly <clears throat> with the major over IAD and goes through every complaint and how it is uh, uh, assigned and how it is processed. And she looks at and questions our uh, general orders as, as well as makes recommendations. And so that process is in place currently. Okay. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Point okay. of clarification, Mr. Mayor, can we get a ruling on the floor from city attorney, please? There was a motion and a second put out. A motion and a second for what? Of a suspension of the rules. You could have listened, that happened earlier. That's, you're out of order again. What, what, is, what is the motion to suspend the to suspend There was rules a motion what? by Ms. Arnold to suspend the rules and I seconded it. And you said you were not going to recognize it. It's not even a clear motion to suspend the rules to do what? I, I don't know. You should ask who made the motion. A motion to suspend the rules to do what? Ms. Arnold? Please okay, moving on. Still. District 11. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have some questions for the city manager. Councilman. Uh, would you just elaborate a little bit more on what you're discussing earlier about um, your role and, um, and that interaction, please? Thank you. I was going to say, and I was going to apologize to the mayor if I over-talked him. I was going to say I was trying to share with him that I would begin uh, to have the answers that he might ask as it relates to me being allowed to decide uh, which one of my staff members uh, should be responding to questions. And again, as I'm the city manager, uh, I'm ultimately responsible. So if 
I would like any question directed to me as opposed to my staff. That was what my intentions were, and that's what I was trying to say to the mayor uh, beyond being out of order, which, again, I'll apologize for that, but I just wanted to make the statement that at any point, if I desire my staff to stop receiving questions and or responding or I want to respond, I have the right to do that uh, because I do believe that's in the council rules that allows those things to flow through me. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, but I'd really like, uh, quite honestly, as we've been talking tonight, uh, to focus on uh, some things that we uh, have tried to do the last few days to begin this conversation around making real change uh, to our law enforcement practices. Uh, and I did share a memo with the council and outlined several things, uh, and many of which, or at least two, have already been implemented. I'd hope to find a way to get that, again, more broadly discussed. I believe it will be discussed at the Public Safety Committee. Uh, and we'll go through that. Uh, but there are several things that have been asked for by many of the protesters that we've already begun to do. And we look forward to continuing those efforts uh, as it relates to how we proceed with policing. Additionally, I didn't share it, uh, but this whole conversation about divesting funds, uh, I had shared with several council members, uh, left it out of uh, the memo that I was going to provide that list of options uh, and allow the council to have that discussion during the, the budget process uh, if you would like to take that option. So thank you again. I appreciate the opportunity to chair. And again, uh, for those watching, uh, I apologize uh, if it seemed like we got a little heated, but this is very tough times for everybody and a lot of emotions are raw uh, and we're working very hard uh, on both sides of the dais. And I appreciate everybody's efforts and continue to pray for this city and hope that we as a community and come together as one Dallas. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I I'm sorry, Mr. City Manager. Um, and, and I would also like to just kind of respond a little bit to my colleague, uh, Ms. Arnold's comments. Um, from my perspective, this is not about judging uh, uh, the City Manager or the Chief of Police. I'm still very supportive of the work they're doing in the city. And I do believe they're doing their best uh, to their ability in very, very tough situations. We do have some questions that need to be answered. Um, I don't, I have to agree with the mayor. I, I don't understand why if you have less than lethal weapons on hand that they're not inventoried and you don't count that stuff out and count that stuff in so that we know whether they were used or not. That's an answer, a question that we need the chief to answer later, but we need to figure that out. I don't understand when there are options on a bridge like just tell protesters to go home. They weren't breaking windows and they weren't uh, setting stuff on fire why it had to end up being arrest. So I, I think the chief needs time to, um, to work through that kind of response. But I don't think that, I think those are the kind of things that we are learning from. Uh, I, it's, I, I shake my head every time in, in, in government because the expression history repeats itself and we've not learned from protests from the American Revolution for, you know, how to manage them. It, uh, but with all that being said, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, we need to look at some of the root causes in our department of, of, um, of, of, of why there are, we have repeated incidents of brutality, not all officers, but for some reason, officers that are that way are protected. I mean, in, you know, in Minnesota, there's a guy that, that had a lot of offenses, uh, an officer that had already been reprimanded several times for that, and he's a training officer. So there are some things fundamentally broke about our system, not just in Dallas, but we got to look at what's broken the Dallas system and correct it. And we, we got to move away from what my not so many friends on the association refer to as the Dallas way of policing. And we need to get to the 21st century way of policing, which engages the community and supports the community and does things like provides uh, uh, um, uh, uh, protest support divisions that work with the protesters as opposed to deploying riot divisions to work against the protesters. So with that, got a lot more to say in the future and, and I appreciate it, uh, uh, Chief and City Manager.
and mayor, it's tough times for all. Let's just get them sorted out and move the city forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Of course. And I will just, for housekeeping purposes, reread the official meeting topic because I'm going to be strictly enforcing the germane rule to the rule on being germane to the official meeting topic. We're supposed to be discussing the response by the city of Dallas and partner government agencies to protests over the killing of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020 in Minneapolis, as well as civil unrest leading to the declaration of a local state of disaster on May 31st, 2020. So any comments or questions really do need to stick to that topic. And I will go to District 12 now. Mayor. To the people who have spoken at today's meeting, posted their thoughts and concerns on social media, participated in virtual calls this week, published editorials, talked with me at the daily protests that happen in far north Dallas District 12, and have spoken with me one-on-one, -on -one. I wanna thank you for sharing your voice and your stories. Justice, justice shall you pursue. This is Deuteronomy 12, 18. And I hope justice will be served in the murder of Mr. Floyd. My faith teaches that every person has dignity and value and every life is sacred. As a council member, what I saw on Friday and early Saturday was Dallas spinning out of control. So I, like the mayor, I went to the emergency operations center Saturday night, Sunday night, and Monday night. And I went because as a new council member, I wanted to learn more about what DPD sees and how they operationalize. And it was riveting and it was also concerning. It is sad that it took the murder of Mr. Floyd for us to be able to talk about discrimination in a public way. But at this moment, when COVID-19 has forced us to reconsider every detail of how we live our life, it's also fitting that we immediately make the policy changes we need so that every black man, black woman, and black child can live a life of dignity and opportunity. Colleagues, we have chosen public service and our city staff, including our city manager, have chosen public service. But that also includes our public safety officers. And they've gone further than us because they've also pledged to serve and protect. And policing is an honorable and noble career and it's the most essential service we offer as a city. It's clear there are some issues at DPD and my concern is about the leadership, the strategy and the policy. And I should note that our DPD officers who unlike forces in many other cities have a higher percentage of African-American officers than the Dallas general population. So we heard Chief Hall say 27% and Dallas it's 25. Today's news headline about the horrific news of a shootout in a parking lot in a South Dallas church hitting a 15 year old girl. In my district this week, a black woman was found shot to death in a field that didn't even make the news. My sweet friend, Leslie Baker was randomly murdered in her driveway last week. Violent crime is in our city, especially in South Dallas, and it is increasing. We had it increase last year, and now it's increasing again, and it cannot be ignored. When we have less officers and we have no support from DPS, we had a record murder rate and sky-high aggravated assault. Point of order, Mr. order, Mr. Mayor. I thought we were germane to uh, the response to the protests, not crime rates. For every person who's talked about trauma today, um, we, we didn't hear from today or the victim. Do your of best crime. to keep it. Do the response. I understand. The children who lost their parents, the parents who lost their children, the businesses, and even the lives of the criminals who perhaps could have had a life of accomplishment instead of destruction, all impacted by the trauma of a lack of robust public safety. Many of the things I heard include adjustments at DPD but more of the issues I've heard articulated publicly are about poverty and a lack of opportunity. The overwhelming majority of the private conversations I've had with people who are African American in the last week have been about the outright discrimination and suspicion black people receive every day and the toll that takes on their lives. And I look forward to finding a way to help address all those issues. Thank you. District 13. 
Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, and I think I shared most of my comments um, earlier this evening. We got, and I'm looking forward to getting the questions I uh, raised um, addressed during the week. Um, I'm just going forward. I mean, we're going to. Um, we're in a, unprecedented times. We've seen riots and protests in our in our past, but I don't think they've ever been layered with us experiencing the pandemic at the same time. Um, obviously, we are, are seeing unrest um, and we are, everybody's patience is tried. So I just ask as we go forward, um, let's gather the facts related to um, the protests that we've experienced in our city and the events that we've experienced. We need to be grounded in our um, decision making by these facts, by the community input and by the interests of all and um, go forward with addressing uh, the socioeconomic conditions to, to prevent um, prevent some of the outcomes that we've witnessed um, and we've got to be fair and um, have fair and just opportunities for all um, and with that I you know I just asked my counsel um, it's not time for finger pointing or disrespect or silencing um, you know we need we need we're, we have this you know one Dallas um, and I just ask that we try to come together and maybe never schedule another Friday night meeting um, that lasts over eight hours. This is not, it is not ended well. Um, but I, in this, I know these virtual settings are difficult and they're challenging, but we've been elected to serve everybody. Um, and I just, let's go forward and let's gather these facts related to the incidents we've discussed and make good sound um, decisions that are, as I said earlier, that are not um, that are that are not just persuaded by current winds. Um, you know, we need to let our our sales be grounded in in good decision making um, and good principles. So thank you. Thank you, District 14. Thank you, Mayor. I was going down the the path of talking about how we'd evolved, how the uh, protesters had evolved, how our policing had evolved. I didn't get a chance to talk about my firsthand experiences um, in the field with Chief Hall on, on Sunday, um, where I saw her uh, going out into neighborhoods that were not part of the curfew. I haven't had a chance to talk with her in detail about how the evolution of their tactics have really been implemented. I just had to watch from a distance, but I could see it. I will also, I'll go back to the curfew. I think that the protesters have gotten to a point where they have understood that violence is counter to their message. Um, I think it's worth pushing a little faster on the curfew, so I think I could support that, but I'd like to see the recommendations. To Chief Hall, I'd like to ask a question about the last week. I don't know if, if it's TC Broadnax that's uh, gonna be responding or if it's Chief Hall, but I'd like to know when we're going to get an after action report that will outline tactics and responses to the protesters from Friday to today. I'd like to see the evolution in what we've been doing. Um, do we have any when we can have that? So so one of the things that, that we have to keep in mind, sir, is that we've never had an incident to this magnitude that has, la has lasted this long. And so our after action report is done after the event ends. And so each day um, we're dot you know, getting as much information as we can to compile it. But I just ask that you keep in mind we have officers working 12, 13, 14 hours a day. We have incidents, we have uh, uh, protests that are scheduled four, five, six in a day, and they've been every single day since Friday. So getting the information and making sure that everything is documented is what we have to do. And to put all of that information together, we have to first stop in this total event. And we're still in it because we have protest schedule all weekend. And so we, we, we're just asking for us to be able to get through all of the events every day and then put together an after action report. We don't put together an after action report after every single day because staff is right now not even available to do that. And so after this event ends, we put together all of the details, a timeline day by day, incident by incident and lay out uh, what happened the assessment, what we learned, what we should have done differently, what we will do differently if there's 
some uh, general orders or rules and regulations that need to be changed moving forward, and then we submit that information to you. So okay, so so from my perspective, then if you're sorry to cut you off, but we're we're getting a little late, and I want to keep my time kind of short. Um, if we're not able to have a comprehensive after action report now, would you at least verbally answer what your thoughts are on the evolution of your responses over like a week long process, not just in reference to Friday and Saturday versus Monday, but where you think we are today and our, our response to the protests as they stand in an evolutionary perspective? I just want to say, first of all, my officers have done an amazing job. Uh, over this past week. And the evolution has been, uh, when we first began, uh, we, we appeared uh, very calm, you know, showing up in support. And then our tactics had to escalate as the incidents escalated Friday and Saturday. As we saw the turn from Sunday um, and then, you know, uh, Monday, we're seeing that the evolution is turning to that the, the crowds are getting, the, uh, the protesters are getting more and more peaceful. And so we see that and our officers are uh, interacting with the, the protesters and now we're marching alongside of them. So we're seeing the evolution of uh, this entire incident uh, play out. And we recognize that there's a lot of pain in the community. We recognize that there pain, there's pain in the police department. We have African-American police officers. So they're feeling the pain as well as our Caucasian and Hispanic police officers as well. This hit everyone. And so our evolution is that we're trying to work to, to, to make sure that we're hearing our, our residents, we're hearing the demands, we're um, asking them to come to the table. And I think that there's opportunity for that. There was a lot of that today uh, and we're moving forward. So. This, and I, I'm glad that you used the word evolution because that is what it was. It started out Friday evening, early evening, one way. It evolved into chaos and looting and crime, and then it evolved back into a peaceful uh, protest, and that's where we are right now. And as the crowd evolved, the protest evolved, so did we. We escalated when we needed to, and we de-escalated when we needed to. And that is yeah, what Chief, we continue to do. Chief, let me kind of go just a little bit of a different direction as I to put a bow on this. Um, I agree on the evolution on both sides. And I don't think we've done a very good job of telling that story. I started to do it on the path that my daughter, um, some of their friends, the younger people getting their information from social media had misinformation about tear gas and a variety of things. If we can't have a macro comprehensive after action report, I would like to see something more daily, more updated for the public so they can understand the evolution of what our responses are. I don't think we've done a good enough job telling the public what we're doing, um, how we care about what the protesters are doing, how we care about the business owners and the, the property owners, that we're watching all of it and we are responding to it. Um, I'd like to see more of that done on a daily basis. Thank you, sir. You're right. And, um, and we will work to make sure that we do that, do more of that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, that's all I have right now. Okay. Thank you very much. We've gone through um, the second round now. So we'll start on the third round with District 1. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for being here tonight. We, we as a council need to be ensuring that the public is confident that we can do this, that we can get through this. And I don't feel like we accomplished that tonight. We have been bickering with each other, bickering with staff. Uh, it is, as Ms. Gates said, it's Friday night. We're all tired. Um, that may be part of it, but a lot of these disagreements and personal arguments should be happening behind the scenes so that we can handle business here with the public. A couple recommendations for um, additional policy issues. Um, we have elections coming up. We need to prepare DPD officers and how to respond to peaceful demonstrations during an election. We need to ensure that DPD will not enforce any then existing government curfew that may be in existence against Dallasites exercising their right to vote. I would like to consider not or prohibiting arrests and confinement um, of those engaging in protest activities that could increase the likelihood of the West. I'm sorry, it's a fast minute. It, it's just a minute of the third round, but go, go ahead. A transfer of the, 
Can I just finish my sentence? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Finish that sentence. Go ahead. Yeah, so under COVID-19, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to recommend prohibition of arrests and confinement of those engaging in protest activities that could increase the likelihood of transfer of COVID. So crowded places like jails, putting a whole bunch of people in there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you. District 2. District 3. District 4. Mayor, I would like to uh, make a motion to suspend the rules to give Mr. T.C. Broadnax more time to elaborate or, or draw, uh, give his finishing comments. Okay. I'm not sure that you need to suspend the rule for that. If you have a question for him, you can ask him. You have a minute. Ask him a question. I move to suspend the rules to allow him more than one minute to speak. I, I said, my motion should include to take as much time as he needs to as city manager to address us as we move forward. Staff is here to answer questions. So if anybody wants to ask him a question, he can answer. If anybody wants to I second that motion. I, here if I got a second. I believe I got a second. I did. I, I'm not even sure what the what we're what that means. I thought the rule that you were suspending was basically to allow for him to speak. He, he, there's no rule prohibiting him to speak, that to be suspended. There's no rule to, that we need to suspend for him to well, speak. Mayor, can we get clarification from the parliamentarian? Sure. It, I'd, I'd love to get, I, I want to know too. Thank I want to you. know what rule we're suspending. Thank there's you. no could rule that prohibits him from speaking. Hi, Mr. Chair. I'm going to let Bert Vandenberg here at the office discuss uh, that issue. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I believe the rule that, is, uh, that the council member is suspending is the rule limiting the time that actually the council members get to ask questions because it allows the uh, city manager to speak longer if, he, if it is necessary for him to answer the question. But staff time isn't charged. We don't charge, we, we don't charge the member for the staff time. If she asks him a question, he can, he can talk for 20 hours if he wants in response to her question. That's the point. Staff can always answer a question, and we don't charge them the time. I wasn't asking him a question, so that's why this issue came up. We can't have staff just jump over the elected officials when they're asking their questions and talking because they want to talk. They respond to questions. And so if you ask him a question, Ms. Arnold, you've given him the authority at that point by asking him the question under our rules to speak for three days if he wants to, uh, if you guys want to sit and listen to it. So, so ask him a question. So so the question, I need to just get clarification from the parliamentarian. What did he tell me? That legally so uh, Ms. Arnold, what the, the mayor had said that you can ask Mr. Broadnax a question and then Mr. Broadnax can answer the question. As the mayor had indicated, there's no time limit on the answer. The only time limit is for council members in terms of how long they can speak. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Broadnax, would you please give us any uh, further observations or comments that you feel necessary for us to move forward as a council member so that we can, can support you as we seek answers for our public, for our constituents, and for this city as they look at us tonight? That was not really germane to our meeting topic. I'm saying that's not as germane. It let me rephrase. As it relates to the topic tonight, do you could you please elaborate, Mr. City Manager? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council. As we as we support the charter. Thank you. So, Councilwoman, Mayor, and Council, I just really like to read for the public, uh, which I thought I was going to defer until the last meeting, particularly as it relates to our response, particularly to the moving testimony. Uh, and comments we heard uh, from the 100 plus people and then what I've heard while I've been out in the community uh, around calls for action that I think put us in a better place for policing and community engagement. And so the chief uh, in consultation with me uh, worked very hard to try to figure out uh, what we needed to do and what we could do in the moment administratively uh, to demonstrate that George Floyd's death and the resulting protests will lead to change. And so we have talked through and agreed to immediate actions, which are zero to 90 days, that 
six of those actions would be taken. And one, the first, has already been implemented, but it was a duty to intervene policy, which the chief implemented June 4th. Second, was a warning before shooting policy to implement. She's going to review that and implement that by June 12th. She's changing the roll call training bulletin that bans chokeholds and other types of activities that, as you've seen with George Floyd, they were in a roll call training bulletin. She will be replacing that bulletin that has been in existence since 2004 to a general order by the end. Oh, matter of fact, she's already done that, June 3rd. She has agreed to review all use of force policies consistent with the Obama police use of force project for needed changes and revisions and publish them on the dallaspolice.net website by August 28, 2020. She will begin reporting officer contact data on all traffic stops and citations by June 30th that will share and show the demographic information that the council uh, member raised earlier. Sixth, she will create and implement a body and dash cam policy to release critical incident videos by June 30th. And that means we will try to do that through policy to get those videos out in the public much sooner than historically in this city. From a short term basis, she's talking and we will review expanding the right care program, which involves an additional team that will include behavioral health individuals, as well as call diversion of chronic consumers of those services to get those individuals the help that they need so they do not have to interact with law enforcement. They get the services that they might need given whatever distresses they're having. We're committing to do that as part of our budget and implement that beginning October 1st. She's agreed to look at implementing a robust early warning system that will assist the department and supervisors in identifying officers with three or more incidents that may be cause for concern so that we can adequately respond with additional training and or support for our officers. And she's committed to do that by November 27, 2020. Long term, she will work with the community police oversight board and our community to roll out and implement a community engagement strategy anchored in procedural justice to build and enhance community relationships to understand the institutional and systemic issues associated with police departments nationally through the history of this country to better understand everyone's feelings and understand people's concerns around law enforcement and how it's done not only in Dallas but around this country. And then out of that conversation, get recommendations from the community and then respond as a police department on how we're gonna meet the needs of our constituents in this community. Thirdly, she has agreed to conduct a comprehensive cultural assessment in the department as recommended previously. We'll obviously look at that to better understand how we as an organization, not just how our officers are feeling, but how they may be feeling and dealing with and handling uh, what's going on inside the organization that prevents people in some cases from not doing the right types of things. And lastly, we're gonna work in cooperation with the Community Police Oversight Board to review the entirety of the general orders for the police department and work on recommendations to improve those. And so I will say, uh, as it relates to this conversation and what we've learned with some self-reflection as it relates to our organization, beyond the police department, we've all got a lot of things to do. I'm working with the other members of my team to create the conversation as well as some specific actions around economic development, housing, workforce, training, and the things that, again, are the fabric of what makes communities whole. So that this conversation that we continue to have every five years, every time we see a new video or incidents that get back at root causes, that we can address them as a city, and then we can be more resilient and be more responsive and respective of the people in our community. And so again, uh, I appreciate Councilwoman Arnold giving me the chance to share that. I appreciate the mayor giving me the opportunity to share that. 
but this is only the beginning. The real change happens when we all work together. Thank you. Thank you, District 5. Uh, no further comments, Mr. Mayor. District 6. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, emotions are raw across our entire city, and those feelings are valid for every one of you out there. I'm asking the chief and TC to please drop the citations from Sunday night on curfew. I wanna thank TC and Chief Hall for working with us and talking with us on this very tough cho topic and getting to work on it. I wanna thank the public for sharing and talking with us. Let's keep talking. Let's keep getting the work done. The time is now for us to get our knee off the necks of black people in the city of Dallas. Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. District 7. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I also would like to uh, ask uh, City Manager to please, um, and, and Chief Hall to please uh, drop the charges on Sunday evening for uh, curfew violations. Um, I would like to um, also emphasize and support uh, what a couple colleagues so far have said, both Councilman uh, Thomas and Resendez, and I believe that the answer, and it sounds like there's a pretty decent amount of support around this, and it's going to be some hard decisions to make, but we need to divest in our police department, and we need to look at 21st century solutions and how we can, um, in a sense, help the police department uh, from other ways by reimagining public safety and reallocating funds to social and economic uh, services and resources for communities, specifically addressing equity of communities in brown and black uh, population. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. District 8. District 9. At this time, thank Did you. Did you hear me? No. Go ahead, District 8. First, I just want to thank all the, the citizens who came down and spoke today. Um, your word, uh, we are listening to you. We are respond back to you. Uh, keep coming. Uh, we are here. We are public officials. That is going to do the right thing. Remember, community come first, and we're going to always listen to the community. Thank you. District 9, you said no. District 9, did you have anything? Correct. No, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. District 10. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, add my appreciation also for um, all the protesters that have made the, the good decisions to keep things, to show up, to be heard, to say what they need to say, um, and the officers that have come alongside, there have been some really impactful conversations and situations that I have been able to witness and really appreciate greatly. So thank you for the, those officers that are doing the good work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. District 11. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and as I said earlier, thank you for setting up this opportunity for our citizens to voice their concerns and, and for us council members to express our uh, thoughts as well. Um, we just have to continue these safe conversations. Conversations can be tough, um, but we have to create a safe environment uh, where people can, their voices can be heard and uh, people can respond to them uh, without being judgmental. And, uh, and, and do what I believe every ballot of this council wants to do, which is make Dallas a better place to live for all the residents that live here. Thank you very much. District 12. Thank you. I just wanna say that um, it's really clear that we're all working really hard. And I just wanna say I appreciate all of you. And that includes both my colleagues as well as the staff. Um, because we're keeping this germane to the topic, I'm just gonna tell you my concern is that um, we looked really unprepared as a city on Friday night and Saturday night. And I think what happened on the bridge was completely embarrassing. We had no choice but to let people go and to not give them tickets because that, that was nationally an embarrassment what happened. And what I'm looking at is not um, any kind of lynching, that's a terrible word to use. I, 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 I hate that somebody even said that. Um, what I'm talking about is holding people accountable for professional decisions in their leadership. And that's where I see some problems at DPD. And I think we have to address them. And so that's where my concerns are coming from. 
we have societal issues to deal with. We'll deal with those on the budget. That is your time. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. District 13. Comments, thanks. District 14. Uh, thank you, Mayor, no more comments. Okay, that is the end of round three. And with that, the time is now 10.33 p.m. And this meeting of the Dallas City Council is adjourned. Thank you very much.